from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African and Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the Division, and I'm delighted to see you here today for this exciting symposium on the ancient city of Tyre. I want first to thank Dr. Maha Shalabi, the founder and president of the International Association to Save Tyre, for her proposal to hold this conference at the Library of Congress. I want to thank Congressman Charles Bustani, who supported the initiative from the start to finish. I also want to recognize all those who have worked tirelessly for the past year to make this event possible, including the entire board of the American Committee for Tyre and its president, Ambassador Killian. His wife is here to represent him and to represent the association. I want to thank Randa Hudom uh, of the Hudom International. I want to thank Reem Shalabi, who's been an incredible force behind this event, and the Honorable Esther Cooper-Smith, the Goodwill Ambassador to UNESCO, who has opened her home for us to meet. Jan Duplan, who created a buzz around this event with a great media event at the National Press Club in February, and many others. And of course, I want to thank my own division and for all they have done, they have been fantastic. So have our media office, so have our videotaping office and everybody else. When Dr. Maha Khalil Shalabi approached me over a year ago about holding a conference at the library on Tyre, I was thrilled. It had been one of my goals while at the library to do a series of symposia on ancient cities of the Near East. So what better place to start than with Tyre, one of the oldest cities in the world that is still inhabited, and perhaps still inhabited by some of the descendants of the original denizens. What better place to start than with a Phoenician civilization that gave the world its first phonetic alphabet, without which there would be no books, there would be no libraries, at least not in the form that we know today. Let me conclude with a quote from the introduction in the catalog of the most important exhibition on Phoenicians ever held. It was held in the Palazzo Grassi Museum in Venice in 1988. This quote could apply to our symposium today. The conveners of the conference wrote, it is not our intention to present merely documentary evidence and with that carry out a work of diffusion and broadening of knowledge. We believe that reproposing the splendor of this distant civilization means a return to the continuity of a culture which is deeply Mediterranean. Certainly, civilization is progress. It is continual modification and permanent advancement. But we cannot act in the present without an awareness of our roots that penetrate deeply into the past. And now, to welcome you to the Library of Congress is our Chief of Staff, Robert Newland. Robert Newland was appointed Chief of Staff on December 14, 2014. In this capacity, he has, library -wide, he has led library-wide programs and management responsibilities and also oversees the offices of communications, congressional relations, development, the Office of the Ch uh, Chief Financial Officer, contracts, grant manager, management, general counsel and special events and public programs. Robert Newland joined the library in November 1975. In more than 39 years at the institution, he has, received, he has served in a wide range of areas and roles. He assumed the position of assistant law librarian in 2010, and as such, he oversaw the law, uh, he oversaw the collection, development, research, and reference services and outreach to the Law Library's diverse constituency. He also managed the Law Library's development and fundraising initiatives, and last year oversaw the Library's Magna Carta exhibition and its related events. Princess Anne participated in these events, and um, Robert really did a fantastic, fantastic job. 
I don't want to go any further. I want to, to hear from Robert. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, Robert. Well, th thank you, Mary Jane, and good morning. And on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, James H. Billington, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Library of Congress. I have the honor and privilege of serving as Chief of Staff here. Um, and when Mary Jane uh, mentioned the date. I started in December 2014. I thought she almost said 1914. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm old, but not that old. So um, I'm delighted to see so many pe people here today um, for this historic symposium on the ancient city of Tyre. Although the library has sponsored innumerable conferences over year over the years it's my understanding that this is the first conference that has been held on the Phoenicians or and the ancient cities they founded on the Mediterranean so we have a historic moment here for this initiative um, I would like to join Mary Jane in thanking the American Committee for Tyre the Tyre Foundation and Dr. Maha Shalabi the founder of the International Association to Save Tyre I'd also like to thank the Honorable Charles Bustani, Jr. for his support of the symposium, Ambassador David uh, Killian, the President and Chairman of the American Committee for Tyre, and uh, the Honorable Esther Cooper-Smith, who is an honorary chair as, one of the as well as one of the original founders of the committee. And among our many treasures here in the Library of Congress, uh, none is greater than Mary J Jane Deeb, um, the Chief of the African and Middle East Division. Th thank you, Mary Jane, for your vision and leadership. It's most fitting that we hold this conference in the Northeast Pavilion of the Thomas Jefferson Building. As you entered the African and Middle Eastern reading room of the library, I hope you noticed that Tyre is inscribed above the very decorative door. Carthage, another Phoenician city, appears on its left as well. So it's very fitting that the founders and creators of the library were very much aware of the ancient civilizations of the Near East and had the names and symbols of these uh, civilizations affixed to the walls and ceilings of this great Jefferson building. So I'm going to end and just wish you a very enjoyable day. Um, as we hear from a whole range of celebrated scholars, and um, we thank all of the scholars for their part uh, participation today. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, the distinguished member from the 3rd District of Louisiana, Representative Charles Bustani, Jr. Again, uh, Congressman, we're enormously grateful uh, to you for your support. And I had the privilege of just speaking briefly with a congressman this morning about his ancestors and how they came to America from Lebanon. And it's a fascinating story. And I hope we'll hear more about it in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Robert. Good morning to all of you. Mary Jane, thank you for the great work you're doing here at the library. And I, I want to thank all who have been involved in putting this very important symposium together. Uh, it's so relevant uh, to what's happening to today. It's so important for us to reflect back on important history and the lessons to be learned. It, it, I come here with a little bit of humility because there's tremendous expertise in this room. Uh, and in this very important room in a section of the library, which is an incredible repository of knowledge that cannot be replaced anywhere. And so this is a fitting place to hold this type of symposium. And um, again, I, it, it is daunting for me just to stand here in front of you and offer a few humble remarks. Let me just start by saying that um, I've, I've been a long time reader of history, love history. And this came about because of my grandfather, who at the ripe old age of 15 arrived alone from Lebanon, trying to find his sister in the state of Louisiana, who had married someone here. And I don't know how she ended up in Louisiana to begin with. We need to find that out. But I learned a lot from my grandfather, who went from having nothing when he arrived to becoming very successful in business and banking and giving me 
two generations later, this tremendous opportunity to stand before you, first as a very successful cardiac surgeon and now uh, with a, a career in public office. And I owe so much to him. But one of the most important things he told me and imbued in me, not only was the love of reading and reading history, but he taught me about my heritage. I might not have known. And the first time I ever heard about the Phoenicians was sitting on the lap of my grandfather when I was a young child. And his intense sense of pride was amazing. And I remember he told me after the First World War, he went back to Lebanon to find his mother. His father had passed away in the interim time. He found his brother who was on the verge of starvation. And this is just one of many, many stories I'm sure have been repeated across America with the Lebanese diaspora. But when you reflect on the Lebanese diaspora, it's quite amazing because there are uh, people all across this country who have reached the pinnacle of their, uh, their professions or chosen line of work, whether it's the arts, sciences, the professions of medicine and law, education, and so forth. It's quite amazing. And I wasn't really aware of this until I actually got into public office and began to meet so many across this great country. But my grandfather taught me about history, and that love of history never went away. And I embarked on reading and studying ancient uh, Mediterranean history. And fast forward, I took a course in ancient civilizations in college, and there's a history professor there, long deceased, who had a profound impact on me, despite all my education in science. This one class furthered my love of history, took, me, took it to a different level for me, and taught me one thing that I, I have never forgotten, that history is a living thing. It's not old dates and artifacts that have gone away and they're collecting dust. History is living. It affects us today. And I think that is incredibly relevant that's why the symposium is so important. Just take for a moment, I'll give you just a few little reflections on that before I close. First of all, we all know of what's happening across the Middle East with the tremendous chaos and the difficulties, much of it playing out in Lebanon. Well, antiquities are being destroyed across the world uh, as a result of some of this. This is something that's not getting the kind of attention it needs, and hopefully this symposium uh, with public uh, publicity surrounding it, we'll, we'll put that into the public domain. We are having conversations about that in Congress. But it's so important to preserve these antiquities because they have impact on us today. Let me just reflect for just a moment on the city-state of Tyre and what is now Lebanon, but was a Phoenician empire in days past. Tyre was regarded as the greatest maritime trading civilization in the world. And you all know the stories of how, you know, the alphabet and so forth. Trade is critically important and it's relevant today. This is a heated debate we're having in Congress today on whether America will embark on a very aggressive trade policy and provide that kind of leadership to bring us together through commercial relationships. Uh, I think an avenue for peace. Or will we back away from trade, become more isolationist in our own views and basically give up American leadership globally. So what happened in ancient civilization when the understanding of the importance of trade was not quite so well understood, the creativeness, the creativity of the Phoenician civilization was quite amazing and it, and it was centered upon Tyre. So we have a lot to learn by studying the history, learning from the uh, mistakes that were made, but also the great advances that were made. So I want to thank you all for putting this together. Uh, it's a very important symposium. I wish I could spend the entire day with you. I've got duties uh, calling at 10 o'clock. Uh, but um, thank you for your insights. Thank you for your willingness to, to put this together. And I look forward to learning a whole lot more uh, from all of you as uh, you embark further on making this information public knowledge. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much. Before I go any further, I would like to recognize the two ambassadors of the two parts of the Phoenician world. The ambassador of Lebanon, Ambassador Shajid, is with us. So thank you very much for being here. And an old the colleague, the ambassador of Tunisia. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we are delighted to have them both uh, here, our two worlds. Uh, so. Now, we are going to have um, a very special person, uh, Ms. Rodi Kratza, uh, 
uh, who has um, uh, who is the president of the Konstantinos Karamandis Institute for Democracy in Greece and the former vice president of the European Parliament. Rodi Kratza studied sociology at the University of Geneva and continued her postgraduate studies at the Institute of European Studies of the same university. She has rich experience and long tenure in European politics and in Euro-Mediterranean relations. She represented the European Parliament in high-level summits and ministerial conferences worldwide. She was a member of the European Parliament Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, on the Committee of Employment and Social Affairs and other committees. Rodikrasa has always been very active at the international level. She has worked systematically for the deepening of EU relations with significant areas of the world, especially the Caucasus and the south shore of the Mediterranean and the, and, uh, the Middle East. So, shh, you have to lower your voices because of the echo. You see, we can hear everything here. Um, so, I would like to uh, invite her to address us. And uh, thank you, Ms. Kratzel, for being with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for your kind words. Excellencies, honorable members of Congress, Mrs. President of the Tyre Foundation, ambassadors, Mr. Vice President of the American Committee for Tyre, dear friends of Tyre, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure and honor that I am participating in this symposium dedicated to Tyre in a church atmosphere from the legacy of the historic metropolitan metropolis of Phoenicians. As an active member of Tyre Foundation, I believe that it is an excellent privilege and an important opportunity to share with this distinguished American and international audience all the concerns and commitments for the protection of the cultural heritage and the highlights of the legacy of Tyre. For this reason, I would like, first of all, to thank those responsible for the Library of Congress and the members of the American Committee for Tyre who give us this possibility. I'm sure that the symposium will provide us valuable information for the rich history of Tyre, the role that it played in the international community of that period, the Mediterranean and the near coast of the Atlantic. We'll become more aware for the importance which the world heritage for an ancient people has for the next generations and uh, uh, for the next generations, and we will also understand that the challenges are for the conservation of this civilization. The last few years, we have become witnesses to extreme violence, mainly for internal classes and obscurities mentalities with destructive uh, consequences for monuments and symbols of world heritage. This have been uh, other destructive actions and uh, cases of occupation or of, uh, even during periods of peace due to indifference, ignorance, or natural disasters. We can also recall where there has been destruction of religious monuments which belong to minorities. There has been, of course, legal instruments for the protection of cultural assets, such as the UNESCO engagement or the Hague Convention and its protocols, as well as the decisions for the Security Council of the United Nations for emergency cases of armed conflict. The most important issue, though, is the prevention of the destruction and the activation of the domestic population and the politician actors. I know that the American society shares this political and moral global responsibility. I had the opportunity to collaborate with the American congressmen and uh, the American institutions in these areas as member and vice president of the European Parliament. I feel the obligation to mention that already from April 1863, President Lincoln announced the general directive for the protection of cultural assets of war zones. Later on, on April, 
on April 1935 in Washington, there has signed the Convention for the Protection of Artistic and Scientific Institutions and Historic Monuments, where it's also determinated about the cases of protection for armed conflict. This tradition interprets your sensitivity and the active interest for the world heritage, and particular for the unique history for Tyre and Lebanon. From today's symposium, will also ascertain the inspiration that the heritage could give us for modern uh, creative projects. This is another dimension of the fantastic works of the Tire Foundation and the International Association to Save Tire. Here, I would like to congratulate the president and the founder, my friend, Dr. Maha El Khalil Chalabi as well as the partners and members of the foundation and the association for their commitment, their creativity, and their efficiency. We'll mention further on the labors of the symposium in those projects, such as the institute, the library, and the virtual museum for Canaanite, Phoenician, and Punic cities in Beirut, the Elisa Didon Prize, the handicap village in Tyre, the revival and the uh, reclamation of the ancient civilization of the Phoenicians contribute to the radiance of Tyre and Lebanon in general. This is also very important to mention the League of Canaanite, Phoenician, and Punic cities, which constitute of uh, uh, islands and cities in the Mediterranean, stations on the road of Phoenicians, Greece, my country, a country with a great naval tradition and civilization, with historic interaction with the Phoenicians, participates actively, and we are in the process to create uh, the Greek Committee for the reinforcement of these uh, activities. These initiatives offer many opportunities for research into the past, but also dialogue, exchanges, and collaborations for common development projects of mutual interest. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share with you my feelings that today we will have an exceptional day for the exceptional tire. Thank you very much. And now we're going to have really the star of this event. Dr. Maha Shalabi is the initiator. She is the mover and shaker, not only in Washington, but in Paris, in London, uh, in Lebanon, and everywhere she has been. She is the person who has put Tyre once again on the map historically and um, uh, culturally. A native of Tyre in South Lebanon, Dr. Maha Khalil Shalabi grew up surrounded by the prestigious vestiges of this ancient city on which eight successive civilizations have laid their imprint. For almost 30 years, Maha Shalabi has dedicated herself to making Tyre better known. And I have to tell you, she has succeeded and succeeded very well. She graduated with a degree in political science from the Faculty of Law of Saint Joseph University in Beirut and earned her doctorate in history from the Sorbonne. Starting in the 1970s, she worked hard to get Tyre recognized as a World Heritage Site in order to ensure its protection. Soon thereafter, starting in 78, UNESCO recognized the necessity of safeguarding the whole of the archeological site of Tyre and its surroundings. She received also recognition by the United Nations Security Council the European Parliament, the American Senate, the House of Lords, the World Federation of Twin Towns followed and all unanimously agreed to declare Tyre a World Heritage Site. Strengthened in her resolve by the support emanating from the world's highest political organizations, Mahashalabi created the International Association to Save Tyre, which assembled eminent personalities from the worlds of culture and science all deeply concerned about the future of this ancient metropolis. On the 5th of May, 1980, during the Day of Tyre, 
held at UNESCO's Paris headquarters, the International Association to Save Tyre received official recognition, and Maha Shalabi was elected Secretary General. In February 1986, the French president awarded Maha the Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite, a medal for exceptional services. In March 1986, the French Minister of Culture named her Officier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. In 1988, the Lebanese president named her Officer of the National Order of the Cedar. There's much, much more to say about this fantastic lady, but I would like her to say a few words. So, thank you. My dear distinguished audience, Mr. Ambassador of Lebanon, Mr. Ambassador of Tunisia, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor that we launch the Memorable Day for Tyre, paying tribute to this very old city within the premises of the eminent cultural monument, the Library of Congress. Culture has always been a solid bond between Lebanon and the US, with the series of Lebanese American writers and poets from Amin Rihani, Lia Abu Mahdi, Michael Nami, and the famous Jibran Khalil Jibran. Today, we go further back into the past to celebrate a Phoenician city, Tyre. It's also with great delight that we welcome the broad spectrum of distinguished friends who came from around the world to take part to this glorious meeting celebrating Tyre, the queen of the seas, the ship of perfect beauty, and the mother of civilizations. Some might wonder if it's still timely to speak about this Phoenician city. What can we add to all what has been related since ancient times to present day. Despite the significance of what has been written and published, we are confident that a lot is yet to be revealed. All the discoveries remain below what the future may unveil about the history of the city-states that had led the the basis of peaceful globalization, connecting ports and cities of the ancient world around the Mediterranean, seeking for establishing a peaceful exchange. Tyre was also the homeland of great scholars who left their marks on the human past and contributed to its progress at a time when the ancient world was still primitive. Eminent philosophers like Thales, Ulpien, Pythagoras, and Prophir contributed to the glory of Tyre. Kingdom of great kings and builders like Hiram and Hiram Abbey. Motherland of Cadmos, Elisa, and Europa, Tyre has yet to unveil its countless hidden treasures. Scientists are still monitoring recent archaeological excavations which promise to disclose, to disclose more wonders. Here in the new, new World, the Library of Congress recognized a long time ago the prominence of Tyre and its role in the development of human civilization. It's by no coincidence that the name of Tyre tops the main door of this hall. Today, knowledge and wisdom take its roots from the glorious ancient world, and Tyre was one of its pillars. It's a great honor for us, people of Phoenicia descent. It's a source of noble pride. 
Our gathering on this very day dedicated to Tyre within the Library of Congress would not have been possible without the concert efforts of the head of, uh, admi uh, of the head administrator of this institute, Mr. James Billington, the librarian, and Mrs. Mary Jane Deeb, head of the African and Middle East Division. Our appreciation goes also to all present uh, loyal speakers who are supporting our action by their research and studies. You are the real engine for moving forward. Honorable Congressman Charles Bustani, we are very grateful for his tremendous support sponsorship and commitment to give tires such a memorable day. And finally, I wish to thank all the participants for their great work and dedication. You are the real custodians of culture and committed promoters of knowledge. God bless you. Well, you have heard really from the person who, who has made all this possible. And now, um, last but not least, I would like to, um, to introduce um, Richard Arndt. Uh, Richard Arndt has um, a CV, a bio, which is so long. Uh, that it was very difficult for me to cut it down. But uh, anyway, I'll try briefly uh, to say he has been the chair of the US Committee for the Preservation of Ancient Tyre from 2000 to 2014. He is the past president, co-chair, advisory council of Americans for UNESCO. He's the past president of the Fulbright Association. He's the founding editor of the journal Prospects and Respe uh, Retrospects. He is the chair of a five nation selection committee for the Fulbright Prize for International Understanding. He is the founding chair emeritus of the Lloyd Roth, Lois Roth Endowment. He has been a member of the steering committee for Fulbright legacy lectureships and professorships at Pembroke College at Oxford. He has been the chair of the National Peace Foundation between 92 and 95 and the co-chair of its Peace Builder Award he has also been the advisor of the Toda Institute for Global Peace and Policy Research, the East-West Center in Hawaii. He has a long, and over and above this, he's also had a very long and successful career in the US Foreign Service, where he worked between 61 and 85 with the United States Information Agency and the Department of State in Washington, DC. He also served in the Department of State Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, where he was deputy director for Latin America. But he has served at American embassies in France, Italy, Iran, Sri Lanka, Lebanon, among uh, others. So I would like to invite him to, uh, to give us, to round up this first panel. We're running out of time. I brought some notes here, but I don't think I'll read them. <laughs> As uh, Mary Jane has uh, told you, I've led a very peculiar life, <laughs> scattered all over the place. But my original job was to uh, greet you and to welcome you on behalf of the American Committee, uh, which I've been asked to rechair in the absence of David Killian, Ambassador David Killian, who's somewhere between Korea and Los Angeles at this very, very moment on a train, uh, plane, which is heading in this way, and we hope he'll be there in time for dinner tonight but that's the diplomatic life for you. The th thing that I wanted to reflect on very quickly, very quickly, because we have lots of interesting things to do, is that we are living today we're in the presence of one of the great mansions of the American mind. This, this house here, as it were, was founded by Thomas Jefferson, I suppose, uh, among others. And uh, there's another one down the street which was founded by an Englishman named Smithson and uh, two, two professors from Princeton named 
uh, Henry and uh, Spencer Baird. And these two mansions of American intellect and mind sit here on the mall in a town uh, in which uh, the use of mind is uh, largely turned to other pursuits. <laughs> uh, and the result being that, uh, that questions like tire often get uh, lost in the, in the melee. Uh, in contrast, for example, to 1943 when a delegation came to President Roosevelt and said, you're going to invade Europe, you've got to save the monuments. And so the monuments men, and you've all seen, I suppose, the film now, which is one tiny little fingernail about what the monuments men actually did, went along with the troops and did what they could to preserve, to maintain, to repair in some cases, and to restore to their rightful owners some of the works that were, had been disrupted by war. Surely the same thing is happening in the Middle East now. The war that is raging makes almost, almost anything serious impossible. And yet civilized people, and I believe we're all of that in this room, uh, should get together to do something in order to save Tyre for posterity. Now, uh, I, I did actually bring this book only to show you that Someone is doing something about it. This is the catalog. I can hardly lift it. <laughs> it's uh, the catalog of the exhibit called Syria to Iberia. That's just because it rhymed, you see. Uh, uh, which took place at the Metropolitan Museum this uh, winter and spring. It's an, it was an astonishing show. Something like 130 museums from around the world all pulled their things together to talk about the Hittites and the Medes and the, uh, all of these strange people that we all know about, but we don't quite remember where they belong. But the Phoenicians were right there at the bottom all the way through. You open this book, you look, and page after page, there is Phoenicia, there is Tyre, there is Sur, uh, Sur, what do we say? Uh, uh, Tyre and Sidon, Sidon, uh, and so forth. And so it's all there, and yet it hasn't been done. There has to be a book maybe not quite as thick as this one, but at least a serious book about Tyre one of these days. And I would hope that after the publication that must emerge from this, from this symposium, and by, by the way, which should probably be prefaced by that remarkable uh, introduction that Ambassador Shadid made last night at the embassy, which was full of interesting insights and new ways of looking at the Tyre problem so that uh, it's, uh, it's with great hope that in uh, the mansions of mind in America and all over Europe, I know I count six or seven different countries who've sent scholars to this symposium, whereas in the old days we used to fight with the French all the time. Now we're, we're, we're friends with the French. We work together on everything, including in this show. So let's, uh, let us uh, work hard to see what we can do uh, as human beings, as civilized people, for the future of the world insofar as that little corner of a little pocket of water, rocks, and earth called Tyre uh, is able to be saved for humanity. Thank you. So now we are, we've concluded with our uh, introductory panel. I thank you very much. Let's give them a, a hand. They've done. So the first panel is the Tyre Cradle of Civilization. And we will begin with uh, Dr. Laila Badr. Dr. Laila Badr is the director of the Archaeological Museum at the American University of Beirut. She holds a doctorate from the Université de Paris, La Sorbonne. She has excavated numerous sites in Lebanon and Syria as well as in Dubai, in Jumeirah, uh, in 6970, and in Yemen as well. She has directed the archaeological work in Tel Kazel in Syria between 85 and 2010, and in Tyre in 2012. She considers her major achievement, despite all these incredible achievements, she considers her major achievement to be the total renovation of the American University of Beirut's museum in 2006, and also the creation of a new crypt muse uh, museum 
at the St. George Cathedral in Lebanon. She's the founder of the Friends of the AUB Museum and the founder of the Lebanese National Committee for the International Council of Museums. She's also the founding member of the Lebanese National Heritage Association. So, Dr. Laila Badr. I'm very honored to speak in this prestigious institution, the Library of Congress. Thank you, Maha, for inviting me here. The subject of my uh, presentation is the first Phoenician temple in Tyre, which, uh, which we have recently excavated uh, in, in Tyre. By launching a new excavation project in Tyre, the main objective of the American University of Beirut Museum team was first to reach the Phoenician levels of the famous Phoenician city of Tyre. The second target was to discover the assumed temple whose possible location was mentioned to us by Mr. Badawi, the director of antiquities in Tyre. The early temples of Tyre have been mentioned in several historical sources. To mention but a couple, first the Ugaritic legend of Keret from the 14th century, where King Keret stopped during his trip at the shrine of Atirat of Tyre. This temple was probably located on the mainland. Second, Herodotus in the fifth century BC gave a detailed description of the temple of Heracles Merkart, the main temple of Tyre, which had two columns, one, one of gold and one of emerald. But the most important iconographic source where the city of Tyre is represented in a sculptured relief from the palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh, dated to 690 BC. A temple, probably that of Melkart, is depicted above the port with two freestanding columns, as you see it, indicated by the arrow. The site which we selected to, uh, to excavate is located on the island of Phoenician Tyre. It's a known fact that ancient Tyre was originally a rocky island, hence its Phoenician name, Tsur. Alexander the Great joined it later to the mainland by a causeway over which sand deposits accumulated through the years, forming an artificial isthmus. This island appears now as a peninsula stretching out to the sea. What did our site uh, of what did our site of Sector 7 look like before the investigations? After the departure of Emir Maurice Shehab from Tyre at the break of the Lebanese War in 1975, the Sector 7, which is located within the Phoenician island of Tyre, had been abandoned for nearly 40 years. The consequence of this abandonment resulted in the growing of a four meter high reed forest, which covered the entire area to be investigated by the AUB museum team. To our great surprise, some ancient walls began to appear, but the greater surprise was that the site had already been excavated by Emir Shihab some 40 years ago without anyone knowing about it. Not a single report or archives were available to indicate this earlier discovery. Yet, in the process of my research, I discovered the following lines written by Shehab in 1979 at the First Phoenician and Punic Congress in Rome. He mentioned, among other results of his excavations in Tyre in 1973, a large Phoenician monument with a 10 meter long wall that we will show later. It's obvious that Emir Shahab did not recognize then the nature of this vast monument as he mentioned it. Our luck was this, was that this monument clearly refers to, to the temple we were about to excavate. 
Our, ask was therefore, our task was therefore to rediscover the site and to complete Shehab's excavation in view of analyzing this important monument, documenting it, interpreting its function, and attempting to determine its historical chronology. The temple in Sector 7 was located under the residential uh, area of the classical period, which extended further to the northwest. What did we actually discover? From the first two weeks, and after sketching a quick working plan of the archaeological remains, we could already assume that we were in front of a temple due to the presence of a massive construction which could clearly and yet tentatively be identified as a podium. The temple has a rectangular shape, 21 meter long and 6 and 50 meter wide. Its axe is oriented northwest, southeast. Several structures were found within the temple. First of all, the podium, which is two meter high structure. It consists of a foundation course surmounted by three courses of very large blocks in hard sandstone. Their setting follows the stretcher and headers pattern, which is well known in the Phoenician architecture. The blocks of this podium can be compared in size to those of the podium of the Eshmoon temple that you can see on the lower photo. which are close in length to ours, but are double in width and height with a uh, weight of two tons and a half, those of Eshmoon. The Eshmoon temple is a gigantic one by its size. It is inspired by the Babylonian ziggurat. It is 22 meter high, but its podium alone has been preserved. None of the temple has been preserved. Our tire temple blocks were extracted in the nearby quarries, which are partly under the seawater today. Two lapidary signs uh, that are shown uh, on the uh, podium, one letter is M, like the McDonald M, and Z, were incised on the upper block. These are probably the signatures of the masons which were used for accounting purpose. Similar signs have been identified on a contemporary Achaemenid building in Byblos. On top of the podium, an altar was placed. It is a very large monolithic single stone slab made out of marine limestone. This, al this altar presents a wavy surface. We may suggest hypothetically that it was used intentionally in order to make the flowing of the sacrificial blood possible. A massive structure located on the eastern end of the temple is built opposite and symmetrical to the podium, uh, to the podium. You see um, the massive structure and the podium on the upper part. One could imagine that this structure could have been the foundation of a massive structure, maybe a tower, and that this tower may have had a niche in which the deity of the temple would have been placed facing the podium. This was the case in many oriental temples. The plan of the temple is indicated by a large rectangle the average preservation of the walls is one course, but sometimes six courses. They are made out of fine sandstone blocks, nearly half size compared to the blocks of the podium. And this is how we could immediately identify the podium because it's totally uh, much bigger uh, blocks than the walls. This, uh, the walls that are generally set in a regular stretcher header pattern as you see it in the lower photo. 
The two long walls of the temple are built against the western wall, which is the western limit of the temple. This view shows the inner facade of the western wall. Its external facade is beautifully decorated with a long, continuous, horizontal frieze of what we call Egyptian gorges. It consists of five preserved courses with finely dressed sandstone blocks tightly set together with very thin joints and without any bonding material. The same architectural decorative Egyptian gorges are known from the Phoenician temple in Amrit in, on the coast of Syria, where it decorates the upper part uh, of its nawas. Similarly, at the Eshmoun temple uh, near Saida, uh, the same type of blocks with the Egyptian gorges have been noted by our team during a site visit to the Eshmoun temple. Some hydraulic installations, wells and basins, which are common in the Phoenician temples, have been found around our temple. They testify to the important role that water rituals played in Phoenician therapeutic cults, as it is emphasized in both Eshmoun and Amrit temples. Sorry. This, um, this basin uh, has four steps that leads to its bottom. It could have been used for ablation purposes in relation to the temple. The main problem we faced was to find the temple entrance, which we finally found. About the center of the western wall, we found uh, this uh, setup or these structures. The lowest platform, which represent, which represent the earliest circulation level of the temple, built with huge blocks about one meter long, it leads into a two meter wide opening with a door socket, the width of which persists throughout the various phases of the entrance. The middle platform is built directly on top of the earlier one and it is also dotted with a door socket. A third paved platform in entrance was added to the two previous ones. It is set between two walls, which were built between the two lateral walls of the temple and which served as arch support for this paved floor. We suppose as a hypothesis that this pavement could have extended with a slight ramp, you can see it on the lower picture, towards the east to reach the embossed level of the first course of the podium. With this hypothesis, it is possible to imagine the entrance of the temple from the west side, not the east, as it is usually the case in the Phoenician or Oriental temples. This would lead directly to the altar level in view of the execution of the sacrifice. A kiln is built against the eastern facade of the podium. Two oblique orthostats placed in an inverted V shape mark its doorway opening. Black traces can be seen on its upper part and gray ashes <coughs> are found near the doorway. An important bone deposit mixed with ashes at small charcoal bits was found opposite the kiln. A small section of this deposit was collected and sifted, producing 17 buckets of small animal bones. It seems pretty obvious that the animals of rather small of medium or medium size, which were sacrificed on top of the altar, were probably thrown directly in the cremation kiln. The presence of a few items found around the temple may be considered as ex votos offerings to the temple divinity. Among these, one stele found by our colleague, Dr. Eric Goebel, outside the temple. All these are uh, outside the temple. 
uh, all the, uh, the presence of few items may be considered as vex ex votos offerings to the temple divinity. One stele, as I said, found by Dr. Gibel, two large stone anchors, a few lamp fragments, not to forget the burnt animal bones found in the deposit in the vicinity of the kiln. All these are extra evidence that our monument is indeed a temple. Chronological conclusions, as we have indicated earlier, in the total absence of stratigraphic records and the lack of pottery material found in C2, it's rather difficult at this stage to draw any final chronological conclusions. Because most of the pottery is mixed, we can only draw some post quem and ante quem periods, the beginning and the end, from the Persian to the Hellenistic period. On this basis, we may tentatively conclude that the temple itself belongs to the Persian period. This dating is enhanced by the common architectural features and masonry techniques which are known from the neighboring temples of the region, especially from the Eshmoon Temple in Sidon and that of Amrud, of Amrit in Syria, as stated earlier. The underwater sounding yielded a homogeneous group of Phoenician iron two pottery. This explains the large number of iron two shirts that have been collected in various points but not in situ. This preliminary assessment of the pottery may hint to a continuous use of this temple, retaining its sacral character from the Achaemenid to the Hellenistic period and possibly including the early phases of the Roman occupation as well. As it stands and with all the very good results we have just presented, we may conclude that our newly rediscovered temple is the first Phoenician temple in Tyre and the, fir and the first complete Phoenician temple in Lebanon. Thank you. We will now have a presentation in French, but we have a simultaneous translation. And uh, this is a presentation by Dr. Naji Karam, an archaeologist, former director of art and archaeology department of the Lebanese University, is a scientific director at CCP Research Institute of Lebanon. Dr. Naji Karam holds a PhD in archaeology from the Institute of Archaeology and Human Science, University of Strasbourg former professor of the Phoenician Archaeology Department and director of art and archaeology in the Department of the Lebanese University, second division. He's a director of the Church Cultural Heritage Committee in Lebanon, a member of the Lebanese organization Sur les Pas du Christ au Sud du Liban, and he's a scientific director of the Institute for Research on Canaanite, Phoenician, and Punic civilization. So, Dr. Naji Karam, if you would like to come up. Mesdames, Messieurs, je voudrais tracer les principales étapes de l'histoire de Tyr qui serviront peut-être de cadre chronologique aux communications qui vont suivre. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to present, uh, I'm going to translate what Dr. Naji Karam is going to talk about uh, today and he will give you a chronological uh, uh, description of the history, prehistory and history of the city of Tyre. L'histoire de Tyr n'est que partiellement connue. Les textes sont rares, les fouilles archéologiques ont été pratiquées horizontalement au niveau des couches romaines et byzantines seulement. L'objectif, c'était de protéger, de devancer le développement de la ville qui a passé pendant 27 ans de 9000 à 50 000 habitants. So uh, the city, the history of the city of Tyre is rare. We do not know a lot about the city um, and uh, Dr. Karam is going to give us a brief description of the various uh, uh, archeological 
and stratigraphic uh, layers that are uh, available. La première période, c'est la période du passage de la préhistoire à l'histoire, c'est-à-dire la période de l'occupation, de la première occupation humaine de l'endroit de lieu de tir. So the first phase that he will uh, mention is, is uh, the pre, from prehistory to history. So we are talking about uh, the first phase of settlement in uh, Tyre. Le début de, de l'occupation humaine semble remonter à la dernière période préhistorique, qu'on appelle le calcolithique. So Dans, les... No. Go ahead. Dans les années 80, le département d'art et d'archéologie de l'Université libanaise, branche 2, a reçu un pot en terre cuite, modelé à la main, et qui date du calcolithique ancien, c'est-à-dire du début du quatrième millénaire avant Jésus-Christ. So the first phase that actually uh, has been uh, 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 proven archaeologically to exist goes back to the Chalgolithic period, which is around 4000 BC. And, it, uh, uh, and the Lebanese university was given in the 70s a, uh, uh, an archaeological uh, uh, find that dates to that period. Cette poterie provenait du camp de Tel Rachedeye, l'emplacement présumé de Paliotyros, ou l'ancien tir, entièrement détruit plus tard par Alexandre le Grand. So, uh, a site known as Tel Rachidiye uh, proves this archaeological find, which is a uh, pottery, shirt, pottery remain, pottery vase, and uh, he will describe it for us. La deuxième période importante c'est le début de l'histoire, c'est-à-dire ce qu'on appelle nous l'âge du bronze ancien. Les historiens s'accordent à accepter la date approximative proposée par Hérodote pour la fondation de Tyr l'insulaire, à savoir 2750 avant Jésus-Christ. So the second phase is the Bronze Age period, the early Bronze Age period. Which, uh, 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 which fits together with the um, uh, um, ancient Greek historian Herodotus, uh, and it dates back to the year 2750 BC. Un sondage archéologique effectué en 1973 appuie les théories qui vont dans ce sens. 27 niveaux archéologiques sont repérés, le plus ancien relevant du début du troisième millénaire avant Jésus. So a, an archaeological sondage, a trench, was dug that uh, 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 reveals these various uh, uh, phases from the uh, 1970s. Um, and it, it, it shows us the, uh, that goes back to the third millennium BC. Au cours de cette période, Tyr commence à devenir une ville au sens urbain du terme, avec deux ports, L'un au nord appelé port sidonien et l'autre au sud appelé port égyptien. Um, in, in that period, uh, Tyre begins to develop its urban character and it, uh, 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 it has two main ports, an Egyptian one and a Phoenician one. Nous savons en tout cas que la ville existait au troisième millénaire avant Jésus-Christ. Son nom est mentionné vers 2300 dans une tablette découverte à Tel Mardir, euh, connue maintenant sous le nom de Ebla en Syrie. Um, there is an inscription in Ebla in Syria, uh, in the site known as uh, Tel Mardir, and it dates to the year 2700, 2300 BC. La troisième période, c'est l'âge du bronze récent, c'est-à-dire la première moitié du deuxième millénaire. Vers 2100 avant Jésus-Christ, les principales villes de la Phénicie sont saccagées par des hordes d'amorites venues de la Syrie du Nord. Les fouilles archéologiques témoignent, à Jbeil, à Biblos, témoignent de l'extrême violence de cette invasion. Mais rien, selon nos connaissances actuelles, ne permet d'évaluer l'impact de ces tragiques événements sur la ville de Tyr et son environnement. So the next phase that we're moving to is the Middle Bronze Age and the uh, 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 New Bronze Age, 
which uh, indicates that in the second millennium BC there was an invasion of Amorites in uh, Tyre, uh, and uh, which indicated that the city was plundered and uh, attacked heavily by the Amorites. Durant cette période, la ville de Tyre, la ville maritime, semble connaître un essor, un nouvel essor et une nouvelle période de paix et de puissance économique. After the departure of the Amorites, the uh, city of Tyre, and especially the port, uh, develops uh, into a, uh, into a, goes through a peaceful phase of uh, existence. La quatrième période, c'est l'âge du bronze récent, uh, qui commence au 15e siècle avant Jésus-Christ. So the uh, third phase is the uh, uh, um, late uh, Bronze Age, which talks about, which is in the 15th uh, century BC. Durant cette période, on constate une alternance entre les périodes de paix, de longue trêve, entre agitation et accalmie. C'est la période des invasions ou des campagnes militaires euh, égyptiennes qui visait tout particulièrement la, la côte est de la Méditerranée. So, uh, during that period, in the 15th uh, century, we have an Egyptian invasion that begins, and several phases of it, and they, they last for several uh, uh, um, centuries. Mais durant les périodes de trêve et de paix, nous retrouvons le reflet d'un dynamisme euh, étonnant au niveau économique, euh, un reflet qu'on trouve, qu'on retrouve dans les textes découverts à Ougarit Rachambra, une autre cité phénicienne qui se, trouvait, qui se trouve actuellement en Syrie. So the, during this phase, there are evidence, uh, there's evidence of a continuous change in the life of Tyre between a peaceful and a, uh, a, a war, war phase. And in Ras Shamra, in Ugarit, there is evidence uh, on tablets uh, of the life of, uh, of the correspondence that took place between Tyre and this uh, other city in Syria. La cinquième période, c'est l'âge du fer, qui commence juste après l'invasion des peuples de la mer vers 1200 avant Jésus-Christ. The uh, next phase is the early Iron Age, which uh, uh, is uh, right at the beginning of the invasion of the sea people uh, in uh, the year 1200 BC. Les villes phéniciennes, dont Tyr, vont renaître des cendres et vont connaître le grand âge d'or de la civilisation phénicienne. The, uh, uh, the local people uh, will uh, begin to develop an incredible uh, economy and this would be the golden age of the uh, uh, Phoenicians. Au Xe siècle, le rôle de Tyr semble dominant dans la partie sud de la Phénicie. Elle étend même son autorité sur la grande cité voisine de Saïda, Sidon, jusqu'à la fusion totale tout au long du 9e et 8e siècle avant Jésus-Christ. The dominance of Tyre in the uh, uh, year 1000 BC rises to such a degree that it expands towards Sidon and there's a fusion between uh, the cities and Tyre takes, uh, dominates the coast uh, in that region. Au cours de cette période, euh, la Phénicie connaît, surtout au 7e siècle, une courte, une courte période d'invasion euh, babylonienne sous Nabucodonosor. So we move in, in, in that, uh, uh, to, towards the 7th century, where there's an invasion by Nabuchodonosor uh, on uh, Tyre with uh, remains on, uh, in, in Tyre itself. Puis ce sont les Perses qui déferlent sur la région et les cités, les cités phéniciennes achètent leur autonomie en fournissant les flottes maritimes aux nouveaux envahisseurs soucieux d'arriver jusqu'en Égypte en particulier. And uh, then we have the Persians who invade uh, the region and invade Tyre in the 6th century BC and leave their traces all the way down to Egypt. Et ensuite la période qu'on appelle classique, c'est-à-dire hellénistique ou grecque, puis ensuite euh, romaine. Euh, Tyr est tellement puissante à cette époque-là qu'Alexandre le Grand l'a assiégé six mois avant de pouvoir euh, prendre la ville. Donc, euh, 
So we move towards the Greek period, the 5th century BC, the 4th century BC, until we reach the phase of Alexander the Great, who besieged the city for six months, and it took him uh, six months to be able to take uh, Tyre, to take the city. Avec uh, la Pax Romana ou la Peromène, Tyre, lui de toute sa splendeur. Métropole prospère et très riche, elle se dote d'un hippodrome, d'arènes, d'immenses thermes, d'un arc de triomphe, d'un aqueduc sur arcade, etc. And then we move towards the Roman period, where Tyre becomes very prosperous, and it, uh, uh, with the Pax Romana. And during that phase, Tyre ad adopts uh, uh, urban characteristics of a Roman city, including um, a um, hippodrome, a, um, an aqueduct, a theater, and so on and so forth. La septième étape, c'est le Moyen Âge, qui commence avec la période byzantine, où Tyre améliore encore sa situation euh, économique. Euh, une régression touche Tyre à l'époque arabe, qui reprend très vite sa puissance économique et devient le port de Damas, puisque la capitale de, de l'Empire arabe était à Damas. And uh, we move then to the early medieval phase, to the Byzantine phase, where the economy of Tyre continues to rise, and it becomes a uh, very important uh, port for the city of Damascus, uh, and there's a very strong connection between both À l'époque des croisés, au XIIe siècle, uh, Tyre devient une seigneurie comprenant 93 villages. Les croisés restaurent les remparts, de la ville, construisent une imposante cathédrale et réaménagent le port qui va leur servir de point d'attache avec leur pays d'origine. Um, during the Crusader period, we have a, uh, an increase in the rise of the prosperity of Tyre, and there are 93 villages surrounding the city, and there is a Byzantine church that, is, that was built there, and the port itself becomes a very important strategic location for the Crusaders in communication with their original homeland. Le royaume de Jérusalem tombe en 1991 entre les mains des Mamelouks, et la ville de Tyr, malheureusement, saccagée en grande partie, commence alors une très longue période de léthargie. And uh, by the end of the Crusader period, in the year 1291, we have the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, expelling of the Crusaders and the arrival of the Arabs who take over the city, and the city goes down in liturgy and uh, decay. Au XXe siècle, donc c'est la dernière étape de l'histoire contemporaine, moderne, la vie reprend timidement ses droits, la ville reste loin, très loin de sa splendeur d'antan. Elle fut certainement la plus grande déception de Renan, Ernest Renan, qui a prospecté la Phénicie au milieu du XIXe siècle. Il écrit « Je ne pense pas qu'aucune grande ville ayant joué pendant des siècles un rôle de premier ordre ait laissé moins de traces que Tyr. And uh, so we continue all the way 700 years in time towards the 20th century, and we would like to mention uh, Ernest Renan in the 1860s who uh, described the city uh, as having had a very prosperous uh, past, but for some reason it has uh, completely fallen uh, into uh, decay. Euh, au milieu de l'indépendance, en 1943, Tyr devient le chef-lieu administratif et économique de la région euh, du Sud. En quelques décennies, elle connaît un essor fulgurant, mais qui reste bien en deçà de son réel potentiel. And so, in the... Uh, um, uh, can you repeat the year, please? Uh, 1943, with the independence, uh, Tyre uh, uh, begins to uh, appear once again with the, uh, uh, um, and a focus on the history of the city is uh, being done, is, t is taken into action. Tyre a besoin aujourd'hui d'une attention particulière afin qu'elle puisse occuper, notamment dans les domaines culturels et touristiques, une place de choix 
la place qu'elle mérite. Tire uh, requires uh, urgent and very uh, and, and a lot of attention in in order to take its place in its uh, 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 history and to be given the right uh, degree of uh, um, importance that it deserves. Merci. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the translation. That was spontaneous and, and, and wonderful. So we really appreciate your help, Alia. Uh, and now we move to our third speaker, Dr. Françoise Bricel chatonnet Research Director at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. She's a Deputy Director of Eastern and Mediterranean, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean Laboratory in Paris. She works on the Phoenician history of the Near Eastern world in the first millennium BC and on the culture of Eastern Christians. She's a member in the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres in Paris. Uh, allow first me to thank everyone. I am very honored to be here and very pleased. And uh, so I want to thank everyone either in uh, the entire committee or here in the uh, library to have made this event possible. Uh, speaking of the Phoenician alphabet diffusion that was, I was asked to do is a huge subject that could well have occupied the whole day. So I will only be able to give a, a few insights on this phenomenon. The diffusion of the Phoenician alphabet is, a well, is well known. We are used to speak of the Phoenicians as the inventors of the alphabet. This subject has thus naturally its place in a series of talks about Tyre. But it needs first to give some details on how I see this issue. The alphabetic system was invented in a Northwest Semitic milieu somewhere between Egypt and the Levant in the middle of the second millennium BC. The exact place, time, and circumstances are still object of discussion. But anyway, it is a period before what we call Phoenician in general, and a span of time and evolution took place before we can uh, Call the oldest properly Phoenician inscription, that is the royal inscriptions of Biblos, of which one of uh, the one is that of Elibal. It's a good representative. You have the Phoenician inscription around the cartouche. Here I will take these inscriptions as a starting point, and I will not take into account the diffusion of the alphabetic script before the first millennium BC, that is, for example, South Arabian branch of the alphabet tree. The second point I wanted to stress is the meaning and purpose of this diffusion and of the form it took. What is clear is that the purpose of the inventor or inventors of the alphabet was to conduct local exchange without translation and convey local myth and literature in their own language and script. In a region where Egyptian and Akkadian languages and scripts had been used for centuries, it was a question of identity, which was at the origin of the invention and use of the alphabetic script. Language and scripts are the expression of a culture, but also a uh, of a collective identity of a group. The diffusion of the Semitic of the Phoenician alphabet with, with, uh, witnesses the same phenomenon. It can be interpreted in terms of promotion of identities, but also of meeting of cultures. It is this phenomena that I will illustrate through three issues. First, diffusion of Phoenician writing outside Phoenicia. Second, the question of bilingualism and bigraphism, writing with two scripts. And then the birth of new alphabets stemming 
from the Phoenician alphabet. So first, diffusion of Phoenician out, uh, writing outside Phoenicia. When speaking of the expansion of the Phoenician world, people always think of the Mediterranean area. But this expansion went all around Phoenicia, and it can be illustrated with these inscriptions of the East made by Phoenicians or by others. And my first example will be this inscription in Jinjirli from the 9th century in the Luvian world, a local king, so it's the south of uh, modern Turkey, uh, a local king of the culture, neo Isis culture, and the local king with the Luvian onomastic. It's a witness of the adoption of the Phoenician language and script. It's, the inscription is in Phoenician language and Phoenician script, probably for questions of prestige. A, a local language and script existed, and we will see it, but was not used there. So we are still uh, wondering why this king did write in Phoenician and not in local, uh, his local language and script. A totally different example is the seal of a good Phoenician, as shown by his name, Abd Baal. And uh, it's, uh, this uh, seal was found in Khorsabad in Assyria. It shows the presence of a Phoenician individual of a very high rank in the society, having his own seal. It was found underneath a winged bull in Khorsabad and was probably not lost accidentally, but put intentionally as a trace, trace of the presence of the owner. So here it's really Phoenician script done by a Phoenician and let in Assyria. This diffusion uh, of Phoenician script went through the Mediterranean. This example is uh, an old Phoenician inscription which attests links to the homeland with the evocation of Baal Lebanon, Baal Lubnan, I don't know, from the 8th century. And then to the West Mediterranean, this inscription from Nora in Sardinia, it's a strange inscription and the meaning is still a matter of debate. But anyway, it is Phoenician language and script from the 8th century. And to erect an inscribed stele already in the 8th century before Christ uh, in Sardinia, it's important. It was not probably not to be read because who would read that? I mean, uh, there were very few f people uh, who could read Phoenician in Sardinia at, the, at that time. It would more be to affirm a visible present Phoenician presence through it. It was a question of affirmation of uh, presence. And once more, a question of identity. Then the, 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 the Phoenician uh, culture was inserted in West Mediterranean, especially in Carthago, and uh, the culture and script became Punic. This is a stele of Carthago Tophet, and on the right, an official inscription of the city of Carthago. This Punic variant of Phoenician can be compared, to have a comparison more speaking here, to what Quebec French is to French from France. In this case, a link in pre is preserved between language, language and script. So there was an evolution, but really within the uh, Phoenician ambience. After the fall and destruction of Carthago, Punic language and scripts were preserved for several centuries in the Numidian regions of Tunisia and Algeria, in Sardinia and in Libya. 
It was also there an affirmation of local identity within the Roman Empire. But I will illustrate it with something less known, an inscription on, of an, on, an anchor found near a, a shipwreck of near Saint Raphael in France, with the name probably of the owner of the ship still inscribed in Punic in the first century BC. What you, you have at the bottom is a copy of inscriptions of the tableware of, the, of some sailors. And all these tableware were inscribed in different language in script, notably these in Punic, which shows that crews were as cosmopolitan as they are now. So that for the diffusion of Phoenician scripts. Then I come to my second point, bilingualism and bigraphism. That means inscriptions in two different languages and two different scripts. Here we have another phenomenon, the meeting between cultures and affirmation of a double identity. This inscription, I go back in time and go back to Anatolia, South Anatolia, very near the Zingerli one we saw before. A confrontation between Phoenician and Luvian, that is Hittite uh, ins inscriptions, in a strictly Luvian context. So we have a very big inscription, as for the moment this Karatepe inscription is the longest Phoenician inscription ever found, but it was bilingual, and on, uh, at the bottom you have the Phoenician inscription and on the top uh, a part of the Luvian inscription. And uh, it was uh, this inscription that allowed the trans the, um, to the decipherment of Luvian. So here we have still someone in a strictly Luvian environment who wrote the longest Phoenician inscriptions ever known. And, well, why? That's a good question. Another inscription well known, which, uh, whose context is better understood. The PRG inscription, which uh, three, uh, three uh, tablets, uh, gold tablets, two in Etruscan and one in Phoenician, as it Punic. It was in the context of a political alliance between the king of Chere and Carthago. So the king of Chere made the inscription and also said that he was a devotee of Ashtart. And then Greece was uh, also a place where there were meeting of two cultures. Here is an inscription, uh, uh, stele, an epitaph, of a private person, a Phoenician dead in Greece, in Athens. The inscription is in Athens. So there is a double inscription in Greek to be read by locals and in Phoenician to be read by his own community. But what you see is Phoenician is first on the top and is longer than the Greek uh, counterpart. And then in Malta, a dedication adapted for two different cultures, uh, to, uh, adapted to two different cultures, Milkart Baltzor, Milkart Lord of Tyre, versus Heracles Fondator. Here also, Phoenician comes first and is longer. It was dedicated by Phoenicians, brothers, who wrote everything in Phoenician and in uh, Greek. Third part, the birth of new alphabets stemming from the Phoenician alphabet. Either through systematic and voluntary process of adaptation and innovation, or through a progressive and natural evolution. I will only concentrate on two main branches, which were very productive and gave all the main modern alphabets. On the first part, the creation of the Greek alphabet, 
symbolized by the history of Cadmus bringing the Phoenician letters, Phoenicia grammata, to the Greeks, a Greek tradition which Phoenicians adopted on their coins, and I think we will see them later. Uh, what we can say now is that uh, the possibility of a Frisian intermediate is now a subject of discussion among specialists. So it goes to uh, the oldest Greek, and we only show this oldest Greek inscription uh, from the uh, 8th century. What we see is that the form of the letters is very close to the letters of Phoenician alphabet. It's, it didn't have any evolution at that time for the, those you who know uh, Phoenician letters, but the system is already a new one with vowels. That was the main invention of the Greeks. And for example, from right to left, you can see ko, ra, kos, with ein already as a, an o, and this aleph already as an a. Uh, and uh, this alphabet was at the origin of the Etruscan alphabet, ancestor of our modern Latin alphabet. So that is well known. I will go uh, quickly to the other branch because, well, I don't need to explain the Latin alphabet here. The second branch, which is also very interesting and perhaps m less known, is the evolution to, uh, to the Aramaic alphabet. Here, we don't have an innovation and a, change, a fundamental change as there was in the Greek alphabet. It's a progressive evolution from the Phoenician alphabet with, uh, without any uh, volunteer change. Here are inscriptions of the ninth century, so about the same, same time as the inscriptions of Biblos, of which I show one, showed one at the beginning. The inscription uh, of Hazael, and the second one of Zakur, mentioning Bahadad, Azael and Bahadad are well known from the Bible. So it, it's a way we can give a date to these inscriptions, 9th century. The alphabet is exactly the same as in Phoenician inscription. I mean, we can distinguish the language, but not the script at that time. Then the use, the alphabet was used within uh, the, uh, by uh, Abrahamians within the Assyrian Empire. It was diffused in the whole Near East through the deportation of Aramic population. And this uh, fresco from Tilbasip is very uh, symbolic of the fact that the Assyrian Empire used both a system, uh, cuneiform and clay tablets on the right, and uh, Aramaic alphabet on uh, raw material on the left. And then uh, what was the Phoenician alphabet was even written on tablets in, uh, within the Ass Assyrian civilization. This from the Louvre. Yes, I'm going quickly. So uh, the, the uh, Aramaic script diffused uh, all around Asia, and I will just give you uh, examples with these uh, inscriptions which were found quite uh, recently on the antiquity market. And uh, it's an Aramaic inscription from Bactria, a region corresponding with North Afghanistan and South Uzbekistan, and its administration of the, of the Achaemenid Empire, so a fourth century before Christ, and around 300 BC, uh, no. Aramaic was used by Ashoka, founder of the first Indian Empire, uh, the Maurya Empire, uh, saying that he converted to Buddhism, and it's written in Aramaic. A later variant of Aramaic, the Syriac script from Edessa, Edessa Aramaic, diffused to Central Asia. You have the, on the left tombstone from Kyrgyzstan, and up to China, the very famous Xi'an stele from the 8th century, written in Chinese and Syriac, so Aramaic, with 
uh, what was at the origin Phoenician alphabet. At the end of antiquity, the alphabetical system of script was used from the Atlantic coast of Europe and North Africa to Central Asia and even China and India. And at the end, I want to, uh, you to see also this uh, alphabet coming to other, script, to other languages and begin to be other scripts. Alphabetic Aramaic use in a Parthian, that is Iranian context, in the first century AD in Central Asia. And so uh, that is uh, for, uh, Aramaic alphabet writing Iranian. Then transferred uh, to write an Indian language and becoming an Indian script is Karoshti. And it's no more an alphabet, but it's stemming from the Phoenician alphabet through Aramaic. And last but not least, the birth of the Arab script with this inscription, uh, it, which is also this picture tribute to our friend Eric Goubel, because this monument is in Musée Royaux d'Arrêt d'Histoire in Brussels. It's a Zabad inscription, uh, 512 AD, on the lintel of a church, and it was the first dated Arabic inscription. So you just see on, a, on the top a Syriac inscription, but just on the, uh, so, uh, the lower part, there is the oldest dated Arabic inscription ever known. First dated, I mean. A trilingual inscription because in the other part there is also Greek. So with uh, this diffusion from Phoenician to Arabic, we come to the fact that uh, Phoenician was really at the origin of what is very important in our civilization. Thank you. So now, Dr. Elisabeth Fonton, the honorary chief curator of heritage in France, uh, will be speaking um, after a stint at the National, at the National Ceramic Museum of Sèvres and the General Inspectorate of Museums. The bulk of her career has been in the Department of Oriental Antiquities of the Louvre uh, Museum, where she was responsible for collections on Assyria, Phoenicia, Palestine, thank you, Jordan, as well as those on Syria and Cyprus in the first millennium BC. She was a scientific exhibition curator from Horsabad to Paris and the discovery of Assyria at Louvre Museum in 1993 and from Tyre to Carthage, the Mediterranean of the Phoenicians, and the Arab World Institute in Paris in 2007. She's one of the editors of the catalog Traditional Phoenician Sculpture at the Louvre uh, in the Department of Eastern Antiquities. She has worked in the International Cooperation Program of the Louvre Museum with Jordan, Syria, and Palestine, was a lecturer at the Ecole du Louvre. Her publications in preparation include the ivories of Arslan Tash, Syria, and the Durigello consuls, collectors, and traders in Sidon. And we will have a brief presentation after which we'll have a break. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to speak in this place. The first pieces from Phoenicia enter the Louvre in the middle of the 19th century. They came from Amrit, Byblos, and Sidon. The sarcophagus of Ashmunazor was presented to the Louvre by the Duc de Luynes in 1855. The collection from Tyre was assembled a few years later into three different ways, scientific missions, acquisition from local dealers and antiquaries, and official excavation. The most important of the scientific missions and the most famous is, of course, the one led by Ernest Renan, the Mission de Phénicie. Renan was given by Emperor Napoleon III a scientific mission for the purpose of conducting epigraphic and archaeological research in Palestine and in Syria. 
This mission happened to take place right at the same time as the French military expedition sent to protect the Christians. Renan sailed off for the Levant on October the 21st, 1st, 1860, and left Beirut the following year on October the 10th. He decided to split his research into four campaigns, from north to south, Ruad and Amrit, Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre. He wishes to include in each campaign the digging in the most important places and a survey as complete as possible of the surroundings. With the help of the, uh, the, help of the French Army, especially the Marine, this program was achieved within six months. Renault started the exploration of Tyre on March the 4th, 1861. He knew it would be difficult to, to reach the deepest levels in the, island, in the island, as the ancient city was covered by the modern town. And he was afraid of having no results in this prestigious site. The oldest item found in Tyre is this ball, is this ball head of a terracotta figurine discovered in an eight meters deep trench on the location of the old serai. This head was inserted in the body made on the wheel. See for comparison, a complete figurine from Ezib now in the Louvre, dating from the Iron Age two, that is, 8th, 7th century BC. Renan wished to explore the continental town on the mainland called Ushu or Paleotiros, but he was more su successful in the surrounding area. At Neifed, he discovered a fragmentary marble sarcophagus decorated with figures in the Phoenician tradition, see the two sphinges on the lid, mixed with Roman motifs. A large basalt relief from Douai shows Apollon and Artemis, or Helios and Selene, sitting on bulls and facing a palm tree. In April, Renan started excavating Um el Ahmed, or as he said, Um el Awamid, ancient Amon, situated at 19 kilometers south of Tyre. He found there a lot of fragments of sculptures, human heads, lower part of a standing man wearing a changed skirt, bodies of sphinxes, a votive throne, called also Astarte's throne, and some pieces of architecture, a unique capital, and fragment of architrave adorned with winged sun disks. Among the finds were three inscribed pieces, a dedication to the god Baal Shamin, a fragment of a gnomon dedicated to the god Milkastat, and a base for a statue also dedicated to Mikkelstadt, god of Amun. One of the masterpieces of the Mission Renan is the floor mosaic from St. Christopher Church, dated 575 AD. It was recovered in a very good state of conservation and it was retrieved from its original location by a specialist from Roma to be sent to Paris. Since 2012, it is on display in the new uh, late, galleries, late antiquity galleries in the <coughs> for the first time in its complete composition. Another scientific mission provides the Louvre with a piece from Tyre. Albo Emmanuel Guillaume Ray, called Baron Ray, realized three missions in the Levant. During the third one, 
in 1864-1865, he bought a stele showing a veiled woman. It was supposed to come from Tyre, but from a stylistic point of view, it was most could be Umelamed. Two families from southern Lebanon played a significant role in the constitution of the Phoenician, the Phoenician collection of the Louvre in the second half of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th. The Durigelo at Saida and the Farah at Sour. Originally, the Durigelo were Venetians. The grandfather, Angelo, settled in Aleppo at the end of the 18th century, where he was a consul for several countries, France, Spain, but also United States. His son, Alphonse, moved to Saida in 1853. Vice consul for France, he was very active in the search of antiquities, and he discovered the sarcophagus of Eshmunazor. Later, he went to work for the Mission de Phénicie and gave the, uh, this marble relief from Djanjine, depicting a, a Phoenician theme, an enthroned deity in front of an incense burner with a row of palmets. His youngest son, Joseph Mange, was an art dealer in Saida and later in Paris. In 1882, he sold a marble stele cut to be reused in the wall of a house in Sour. Five members of the, Far of the Farah family, two brothers, Alexandre and Jean, and three of their sons, Michel, Selim, and Ferdinand, were involved in the antique, uh, antiques market, mostly in their hometown. They didn't claim to be scholars. The art trade was a way of earning their living. They provide, provided the museum with small artifacts, glass flasks, terracotta figurine and mask, a fragment of a stone basin, which is said to have been collected on the seashore in the vicinity of the Egyptian harbor. It is inscribed with the Phoenician name at the bar. They also, also sold a lead coffee from Anaway, characteristic of tire style with the twisted columns. The far were led to work at Oumelamed by the French scholar Charles Clermont Gano to continue the site exploration. They found a, seri, a series of male statues in Egyptian style, presumably worshippers. Unfortunately, all headless. These figures are set against the dorsal pillar, ex except for one, uh, bottom left. Two of them are dedicated on the back of the pillar by Baal Shalem, Baal Shalem, one to the god El, the other to Osiris. They also sent to the Louvre several limestone stele depicting Priest wearing a Persian cloth, veiled woman, and couple facing each other. This type of sculpture was unknown to Renan, and we still do not know the precise, lo the precise location they were found on this, in the seat. Julius Lloydsved, consul for Denmark in Beirut, was fond of, of antiques and assembled a fine collection. He bought in the village of Mashuk an inscription dated to the 53rd years of Tyre, and he sold it to the Louvre in 1885. In Sour, he discovered in a cistern pieces 
of an inscribed monument looking like an house, which was sent to the museum by Charles Gamugamugano. At the beginning of the uh, last century, the Jesuit father, Sébastien de Ronceval, was able to buy some pieces with funds supplied by l'Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, pieces which were transferred to the Louvre later. Uh, an inscribed votive throne on the right from Gerbet et Tayebé, sorry, Gerbet et Tayebé, and two fragmentary stele showing Egyptianizing feminine deities. Said come in the Louvre, in the accession book in the Louvre from Rasaline, or maybe in Der Terta Diba and Elchmashnaka. And also a lead weight showing on a boat on one side and the sign of Tanit on the other. After the First World War, official excavation were organized in Lebanon by the Service des Antiquités during the French mandate. Denise Le Lasseur was in charge of excavating Tyre and its surrounding in 1921 and 1922. Eustache Deloret conducted a new season at Oum El Ahmed in 1921. In the 1930s, the Jesuit father, Antoine Poitbois, realized an aerial survey and submarine excavation in the Tyre Harbor. Later, the archaeologist Maurice Dunant resumes excavation in Oum El Ahmed in 19. 43, 45, but at that time, there was no longer any share, sharing of the results of the excavation, and the pieces discovered are now in the National Museum in Beirut. Since the end of the French mandate, the collection in the Louvre was completed by a few purchases, a Tyrian lead coffin, a bronze tessera, which is said to have been found on the seashore at Sour and is inscribed with dedication to Milkart in Tyre. A marble stone with a four line dedication to Milkart also. And terracotta statuettes from a deposit at the bottom of the sea. To conclude this brief overview, we can see that in the Phoenician collection of the Louvre, very few pieces were found on the island of Tyre itself. Many more come from its surroundings, notably from Oum El Ahmed. Thank you for your attention. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our second panel, um, Phoenician Com Commerce and Exchange. Our first speaker, Dr. Frederic Duria, uh, is the director of the departments of coins, medals, and antiques of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. From 2001 to 2009, she was assistant professor in Greek history at the University of Orléans in France and member of the Institut Universitaire de France between 2006 and 2009. From 2010 to 2013, she was curator of Greek coins in the Department of Coins, Medals, and Antiques of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France until she was offered the position of director of this department in September 2013. She has been an associate researcher at the Institut de Recherche sur les Archéomatérieux, uh, Centre Ernest Babylon, CNRS, a physics laboratory specialized in the elemental analyses of the, of the metal of coins from 2002 to 2013 
and is now associated to the research team of the Orient et Méditerranée Monde uh, Sémétique at the University of Paris at the Sorbonne and the École Doctorale Archéologie of the University of Paris. She presented an a, a habilitation dirigère de recherche at the Sorbonne in uh, 2010 to be published by the American Numismatic Society, Lost and Found, Monetary Behavior in Achaemenid and Hellenistic Syria. She is the editor of the collection Tresors Monétaires uh, published by the, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France uh, and is one of the directors of the Revue Numismatique and a member of the board of the uh, Société Française de Numismatique. She has published a book and 28 articles and edited four conferences related to numismatics or economic history. Uh, please welcome Dr. Frédéric Duria. Well, um, first of all, I wanted to, to thank the Association for la Sauvegarde de Tier for the invitation of speaking at the Library of, of Congress. Being um, myself a member of the staff of a National Library, it's a great honor to, to be here. Well, but I'm here to speak about the coinage of Tor uh, in antiquity. Tyre was one of the most prominent cities of the Levant during antiquity. Its coinage reflects its power. One of the first means active in the haste, its coinage is an important source to write the history of the city. Beginning a little before the middle of the fifth century BC, it disappeared during the third century AD. Before using coinage, Tar, like other cities in the east, used commodity money as crop, or what we call hag silver. That means fragments of silver, either pieces of jewelry or unshaped silver, Wait to know the values. On this image, you can see that even coins, Greek coins, were used like that. That means cut as if they were just uh, silver ingots. From the last third of the 6th century BC, silver coins started circulating in the East. The oldest hoard known was found in Ras Shamra, north of the mouth of the Orenthes River, and was buried around 525-520 BC. It only con contained foreign coinage uh, struck in Macedonia, Thrace, and Cyprus. So foreign coins. By the end of the fifth century, holds bear witness to the first strikes of Phoenician coins from Sidon and Tyre. Tyre built a completely, complete monetary system from the beginning. The major denomination was the shekel, weighting around 13 gram 0.5, and it had a complete succession of division from the quarter of shekel, the half of the shekel, the 32nd of shekel, and even tiny coins that weighed only 0 0.06 grams, so really tiny, tiny silver coins. During the fourth century, there were even bronze coins. Compared to the variety of other Phoenician city coinage during the same period, Tyre's topology is limited to two main groups. The old shows on the obverse a dolphin jumping above a wave with a shell in the exerg. On the reverse, an owl with a hawk body stands right, eight facing, with a crook and a flail on its shoulder. This first group was struck during the fifth century. On the second group, the largest by far, struck during the fourth century BC, a bearded god rides a winged seahorse to right above waves and on a dolphin. On the reverse is represented the same hull as in the fifth century group. This fourth century group has totally different profile from the fifth one. The Phoenician coins gain an increasing place in the Levantine circulation during that period. They even constitute the sole currency present in numerous holds. Sidon vastly dominates with nearly half of hoard content and an area of circulation that goes beyond the limits of its own regional zone of influence. But Tyrus has produced nearly 10% of hoard specimen and its coin circulates rather widely eastward. The image chosen by the Tyrian to strike their coins provide indication of what the city wanted to be considered 
as its official badges. The reverse was terrible during the whole Persian period. The hole with a hawk body wearing the Egyptian insignia of power, a scepter, and a flail. The Egyptian influence reminds us of the long-lasting commercial and political relationship of the Phoenician cities with Egypt, which is peculiar to Tyre, but also sometimes from Awad and Sidon, is the importance given to the sea. The dolphin jumping, jumping above a wave, the shell, the bearded god riding a seahorse are all related to the sea power of Tyre. The interesting thing is that the Hithi horse is winged. It is the same time, at the same time a sea and sky animal. Such an hybridity, which is completely abnormal in a Greek context, is not puzzling since the Phoenician gods can have at the same time power over earth and sky. Therefore, such an animal is a convenient mount. At the end of 30, 333 BC, Alexander the Great won the Battle of Issus and entered Phoenicia to consolidate his victory by the domination of the Mediterranean coast. The control of the coastal cities in Cyprus would guarantee him that the Persian fleet would be kept away when it could have been a menace in his rear during a continental campaign. Aratus, Bibulus, and Sidon almost immediately submitted to the Macedon king, what implied the defection of three major naval squadrons from the Achaemenid fleet to the considerable benefit of Alexander. He acted quickly, prompting the adherence of the cities and their fleets. Rapidly thereafter, fleets of Rhodes, Cilicia, Lycia, and Cyprus joined his camp, but Tyria and Geza remained the only cities to resist. The siege of Tyre lasted from January to July 332 BC. Uh, however, after he had conquered the city, it seems that Alexander didn't change the regime, the political regime, and despite its resistance, Tari kept a king designated by order of Alexander from among the members of the former royal family. All the four main Phoenician cities, Eratus, Bible, Sidon, and Tari, already issued coins in 30, 333. They quickly started to strike with Alexander's types, the head of Heracles on the hoverse, and those sitting on the throne, an, in, an eagle in his right hand on the reverse. You can see on that coin, few uh, Phoenician coins uh, on the reverse of the, co of the coin, uh, just in front of those. It is the name of the reigning Styrian king, uh, Adramelech. It's the first and the last letter in Phoenician of the name of the king. Phoenicia was the theater of an essential change in the monetary history of Alexander, the creation of a gold coinage after July 332, and the surrounding of, uh, of time. This will explain the naval reverse type it shows, a victory holding what we call a stylus, um, the guy uh, of long tools she's got on her left shoulder, uh, the stylus was the banner of warships, usually taken as a trophy by the, wi the winner. And it is here a, a clean reminder of his victory on the city of Tyre. After Alexander's death, death in 323 BC, the whole Near Easter was at war due to the competition between Alexander's companion. They struck silver and gold coins with Alexander's types and, 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 and his name in very large amounts, and Tyre was one of the main means. The circulation of these coins was very wide as for all the Alexander strikes in the East. After 301, uh, 301 sorry, Southern Phoenicia was part of a wider region called Syria and Phoenicia. In the hand of Ptolemy I, the new king of Egypt and a former companion of Alexander the Great, he and his son, Ptolemy II, completely transformed the monetary system of the kingdom and its dependencies by introducing a standard lighter than the Attic standard, which has been widely used as Alexander had chosen it for its coinage. Ptolemy I created a closed monetary system with mandatory exchange at the borders, excluding all foreign coins. In Egypt, the sole mint was Alexandria, but in Syria and Phoenicia, several mints were opened, among them Tyre. 
From 260, the local means seem to have supplied most of the news of the area. Tari signed its production with a monogram written with the Greek letters Tai that you can see in front of the eagle on the rivers, and a club, the distinctive, distinctive attribute of the god protector of the city, Heracles Melkart. At the beginning of, of the second century, Antiochus III, king of Syria, grabbed Syria and Phoenicia. However, he didn't change the monetary system. It is only at the end of the second century BC, when the Seleucid dynasty weakened, that Tari started its own autonomous coinage. From 126 BC, Tari issued this autonomous coinage. That means coin with its own types and the name and titles of the city. From the iconographic point of view, the coinage of Tari was relatively poor. These symbols were the most common as during the Persian period. Pros, sterns of ships, shells as secondary symbols. A palm tree and Heracles Melkart's clubs were also common. This god, patron of the city, was represented young, wearing a laurel wreath. His identity is obvious thanks to the associated club that you can see here on the reverse of the coin, and the appearance of the god himself, a stout neck, strong chin, his head occupying all the available surface of the flan. It is a mighty god whose power comes first from its physical strength. The reader shows a Ptolemaic eagle kept on the Seleucid coinage of the region and then a symbol of an economically reliable coinage. The monogram of the city and its name in full letters appear on the, on the reverse. Um, sometimes uh, on other coins, a TK, goddess of the city 14, is represented on autonomous bronze with a palm tree on the reverse. She is probably the Greek representation of Astarte, protective goddess of the city. All other deities of the city having other skills than politics are absent from the coinage. A political object, coin bears the image of God in charge of the political activity of the community. Syria was transformed into a Roman province in 64 BC. This brought little change to the local coinage. Tari kept its autonomous types, and the issues of autonomous silver coins continued during the first century AD. The real change occurred during the second century AD, with, in particular, the development of references to founding myths and local cults. The, la the latter were evoked through architecture, battles, processional chariots, objects related to religious festivals and competitions, agonistic chairs, palms of victory, and so on. The size of the bronze coins, larger than during the Hellenistic period, allow detailed depictions of founding myths. The, so you have here one example of um, the, 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 the coin types maintained during the first century. Here you can see the change because the reverse, on the obverse, you have the emperor. On the reverse, you have a very detailed scene uh, de depicting, depicting what we call the Ambrosian rocks. They were erected in the shrine of Heracles Melkart under an olive tree. They were associated with the foundation of the city, though the particulars of the foundation remain unknown. They are represented as talus on bronze coins struck during the third century AD. Their identification is clear since the name is written on them, Ambrosier Petre. Uh, under the exit line, a dog and a murex shell remind us of the myth explaining how the daring properties of this shell were discovered. The famous Tyrian purple was extracted from this shell flash. Another coin struck between 244 and 249 AD shows Cadmus. I'm sorry for the quality, but this is a very, very rare coin, and this is the one we've got in the uh, library in Paris. So you can hardly see it here, but uh, it's very clear when you, you read it directly. So it shows Cadmop, a mythic king of Tari on the right, giving a volume to three men on the left. If, it was, if it's not clear just with the image, you've got a legend um, uh, under the exit line, because you have the first letter uh, of the word Elenas under the feet of the three men, and under the man on the right, you have Cad for Cadmos. 
The scene represents Cadmos giving the alphabet to the Greeks, an Eastern heritage for the Greek civilization. Then the second and third century AD coin designs of Tar are multiple, educational and political. They contrast, contrast strongly with the more enigmatic sobriety of the East use of the Persian and Hellenistic periods. They bear witness to changes in the religious practice from the second century AD in contrast to the preceding long-lasting religious rites. They are also a political program enhancing the cultural relationships and heritage between Phoenicia and the Greek world at a time when Phoenicia was deeply influenced by Greek culture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dua, for a very um, intriguing um, presentation. Our next presenter is Dr. Patrick McGovern, uh, who, is the, who directs the Biomolecular Archaeology Project at the University of Pennsylvania Museum in Philadelphia, where he is also an adjunct professor of anthropology and consulting scholar in the Near East section. Over the past two years, he has pioneered the exciting interdisciplinary field of biomolecular archaeology, which is yielding whole new chapters concerning human ancestry, medical practice, and ancient cuisines and beverages. He has excavated extensively in the Middle East, including Lebanon, uh, Canaanite and Phoenician Seraphon. He is the author of Ancient Wine, The Search for the Origins of Viniculture, uh, published in 2003-2004, uh, and most recently, Uncorking the Past, The Quest for Wine, Beer, and Other Alcoholic Beverages. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Patrick McGovern. I'm very happy to be here, uh, and I'm thankful to the Tire Committee for inviting me to talk about uh, two of the technological and art artistic uh, creations of the Phoenicians. I mean, the Phoenicians are responsible for a great deal. I mean, we've heard about the alphabet, we've heard about some coinage, uh, there's shipbuilding, there's metalworking, glassmaking, and I'm going to talk about royal purple and wine. Uh, my first experience in archaeology was actually in Lebanon at a site not too far from Tyre called uh, Sarepta, or Seraphond, which is only about 11 kilometers as the crow flies uh, north of Tyre. And so I have a great affinity for Lebanon and uh, what it really represents, because I think it took you know, technology and art and transferred them across the Mediterranean and eventually to the whole world. So <laughs> it's a very special country. And I think we need to find out a great deal more about it. I mean, I'm really saddened, you know, by the, you know, the events, you know, since the Civil War and so forth, and how difficult it is to, to excavate in that country. But I think it holds secrets that we really can't imagine. Uh, I think architecture too. Uh, we've heard about the Tyre Temple. I mean, and we're going to hear about more more of that uh, this afternoon. So. Uh, I think architecture uh, and temple worship, religion, theater, music, there's a whole series of uh, contributions that the Phoenicians and the Canaanites, uh, the predecessors of the Phoenicians, uh, contributed. Uh, so I'm going to talk about royal purple as a good example of how, uh, or Tyrian purple, we can call it, because uh, there's a, a Greek myth, you could say that the uh, Phoenicians are the ones who uh, developed uh, purple initially, or even back to the Canaanites. And that the words for Phoen Phoenicia and Canaan do derive from ancient words for purple. So this is very integral to uh, the Cana Canaanites and the Phoenicians. Now here we see this myth of Heracles uh, walking along the shore of Tyre with his dog and uh, the dog is biting into different shells. And this is the Greek idea of how maybe it could have been discovered. It, uh, one of the, one of the dog, the dog uh, uh, bites into a murex uh, shell, which has the purple dye gland. And I'll show that to you a little bit later. And uh, that inspires Heracles then to take the dye and make up textiles for his consort, a goddess, uh, and uh, so begins uh, the royal purple uh, dye making. But uh, we have more definitive archaeological evidence, 
and uh, it comes from the site of Sarepta, where I worked in 1974 as uh, Israeli jets pounded the local Palestinian camp. Uh, you had to be you know, very intrepid to work at Sarepta in those days, and uh, Leila Badre uh, can attest to that because she was there at the same time. And it uh, is a site that's located between Tyre and Sidon, about halfway in between. And uh, when they started uh, getting down into the late bronze, early Iron Age levels, this is from about 1300 BC to 1100 BC, which is, uh, this is one of the few homeland uh, Phoenicians, uh, Canaanite Phoenician sites that has been excavated. Now Sidon is getting a lot more information and we hope that Tyre uh, will as well. We came down onto an industrial area, and this was done by the University of Pennsylvania Museum under James Pritchard, who some of you may know or have heard of. Uh, we started finding um, Canaanite jars. I was a graduate student at this time, so I was working on the pottery and going through it very carefully. And uh, you'll see here that uh, this industrial area had kilns for making the pottery, but in addition, it also had uh, purple colored sherds on the inside of amphoras or Canaanite jars and also processing vats for making uh, the dye. And when we saw these purple colored sherds, our immediate instinct was that these were possibly real Tyrian purple. Now they could be from a color, uh, an inorganic colorant like manganese or iron, but if they were the real Tyrian royal purple, they would be an organic compound. And we had just started in on doing organic analyses at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Uh, first, I'd worked on pottery and glass and so forth, and then I was always very interested in organic chemistry, and we were just developing the techniques 20 years ago to be able to analyze uh, organic compounds to see what the ancient uh, dye might be, or ancient food, or whatever. And so this was a very small sherd that we worked with uh, from Sarepta that had the, the purple color on the inside. It was from an amphora. And uh, for those who are chemically challenged among you, I'm not gonna give you all the details, but we've published extensively on, this, on the chemical results. And we have used uh, spectroscopic techniques, techniques, mass spectrometry works very well. And uh, there's a, a particular VAT dye uh, test that you can do that is almost certainly shows uh, that we're dealing with uh, what's called 6-6 six, six prime dibromo indigotin. It's an indigo compound that has two bromines, one on each side of the molecule. And the indigo, of course, gives blue, but if you put the bromines on, it switches the color over to purple. And uh, there's a lot of fascinating details about this dye. I mean, I'll refer you again to some of the articles I've written about. It, uh, it comes from a gland, as I mentioned, in the murex uh, mollusk that's found in the Mediterranean. There's three different species. And uh, this is an example where you can see the, uh, the, the, it's a yellowish fluid that comes out of this gland called the hypobranchial gland. And when it's exposed to light and air, it changes to purple. So it's something that people could have discovered uh, quite easily. And, and there's related species of mollusks all over the world. So the ancient uh, Mayans, Chinese, uh, Incans, and so forth discovered you know, related species. And if you're using it as a food source uh, and you start to handle the murex, you're going to get it on your fingers. And it is a very fast dye. It's very hard to remove. And uh, so people would have realized it was a good textile dye and uh, started using it for that purpose. Uh, okay, so that is a, a little glimpse of the royal purple. There's you know, lots more I could say about it, but now I wanna move on to another luxury good, which also has technological and artistic ramifications, and that's ancient wine, which I've written a book about, so uh, <laughs> you're welcome to ask me about. And I also hope that we'll be having, a, uh, in that first slide at the beginning, I showed a view of the Baca Valley where winemaking has probably gone on for thousands of years. Uh, now this is a map that shows um, in purple, appropriately enough, uh, and I'm glad that some of you are wearing purple today, uh, where the wild grapevine, the wild Eurasian grapevine, Vetus vinifera, uh, grows today. And we think that basically it's the same region. And you'll notice uh, that uh, 
the area, well, let me, before I do that, uh, you'll notice that Lebanon is uh, at the most southerly extent of the wild grapevine. So when humans came out of Africa, say 100,000 years ago, uh, they, and they cross over the Sinai and up into the Near East, they would see the grape for the first time in Lebanon. And uh, I think that they would be quite interested in this fruit. Uh, <laughs> 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 and so they would, you know, maybe start experimenting with it. But now, the, uh, so far, we have a project now up in Georgia, in the Caucasus, you know, looking at uh, the earliest evidence for, for winemaking and for the emergence, well, for the domestication of the grapevine. Uh, it, it, it appears that the domestication occurs somewhere in the mountainous region of the Near East. It could be up in the Caucasus, but it could also be in eastern Turkey, in the Taurus Mountains, over to the Zagros Mountains. But even down into Lebanon, and unfortunately we've had no real gathering of grapes and DNA analyses in Lebanon to test you know, whether it could have first emerged there. Um, but we do know that uh, the Canaanites and then the Phoenicians are very much involved in spreading the wine culture wherever it emerges. And this is a wine culture, by wine culture I mean something like Lebanon today, uh, where wine can become very much, the, of course you have Iraq and what have you, but wine can become very central to the economy, the social life, the religion, and sort of embeds itself right into the culture in a very profound way. But we do see uh, in later periods how this wine culture then spread, principally from the uh, Canaanite Phoenician area. So around 4000 BC, we probably had the emergence of the wine culture around 6000 BC in the mountainous areas of the Near East. Then by 4000 BC, it had spread down to the Jordan Valley, and we have great grape seeds of domesticated grape that have been found about that time. And then ultimately it goes on to Egypt, where you'll notice Egypt did not have the wild grapevine. You had to bring in the domesticated grapevine. And you know who did that? Well, it was the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, and I'll show you a few more slides to, uh, to illustrate that. But then the, the Phoenicians also took the grape and wine culture across the Mediterranean. So it reached, and we've done a lot of analyses now of vessels from Crete, and other parts of uh, even the Western Mediterranean that show that uh, around, at least by 2200 BC, uh, wine was being made on Crete. So the Greeks, you know, are, are absorbing uh, the wine culture. And uh, the earliest shipwreck in the Mediterranean from Ula Burun, which is just off the southern coast of Turkey, dated about 1350 BC, is a Canaanite ship. So here the Canaanites were uh, transporting all sorts of goods and spreading out uh, into the Mediterranean, establishing colonies and so forth. And you'll see there, there's some amphoras on the, this is a reconstructed view of what the Ulibaran shipwreck would have looked like because it, it, a lot of the goods were spread out along a very steep slope. So they tried to figure out what the wading uh, the weight, the ballast would have been in different parts of the ship and the different sizes of amphoras. And we've just, um, are just publishing an article uh, that shows that they had wine on board the ship. This has been sometimes controversial, uh, but we've done a, v <laughs> I, I think if you're Canaanites, you have wine on board your ship. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, we did an analysis of other uh, amphoras that were found in shipwrecks from the 8th century BC off the coast of, um, off of Ashkelon. And uh, they were carrying an enormous number of amphoras. This is a photograph by a remote, remotely operated submersible, but it showed, you know, hundreds of amphoras in the ships. And there were two ships, and they were given the names Tanit, which is the Phoenician goddess, and Alisa, or Dido. Uh, and, and they were carrying, uh, according to our analysis, uh, wine. Now the wine, in this case, also has a resin in it. It can be pine resin or terebinth resin, and that helps to keep it from spoiling. Uh, so uh, they would, then went out across to Greece and Crete, as I mentioned, and I think ultimately 
according to another article that we've done uh, in the uh, proceedings from the National Academy of uh, Sciences, and these are available on my website if you're interested, uh, the French ultimately got winemaking and the wine culture through the Etruscans, and this occurs around the 8th, 7th, 6th century BC, but my belief, and I think it will be shown as more shipwrecks are excavated, is that uh, the Phoenicians are really the ones that transferred the wine culture and the domesticated grapevine to the Etruscans and then ultimately to the French. So the beginnings of you know, winemaking in France go back to the Phoenicians, which is not all that surprising. <laughs> I hope I'm not. Uh, <laughs> hope I'm not upsetting anybody's. Uh, and uh, just to give you the, uh, some examples from Egypt of how important the Canaanites were there, uh, one of the earliest tombs of a pharaoh is the one of uh, Scorpion the First at Abydos around 3150 B.C., and he had 700 jars of wine. Uh, about 4,500 uh, liters of wine put into his tomb. So the king was you know, buried in a, on a bed in the back uh, there with his mace in hand, and then there was beer and bread and so forth in the middle chambers, and then there were three sort of wine cellars you know, stacked up with these jars, and we were able to show that this was again a, a resonated wine that had figs put into it, also it had uh, time and savory. You were eating za'atar this morning. We have shown that some of the earliest wine, and this probably, uh, according to the nutrient activation analyses of the pottery, it comes from the Jordan Valley in this case, and, and the surrounding hill country where the wine was then exported to Egypt. And that gave the Egyptians the impetus to set up their own wine industry around 3000 BC. Um, and we have these beautiful depictions, of course, which probably some of you have seen in Egypt of how the winemaking was done. Well, this is a pretty sophisticated system that goes back to the beginning of the Old Kingdom. I mean, I sh I'm showing a fresco here from the New Kingdom, but there's equal examples from the Old Kingdom. It, it shows how they were able to have arbors or pergolas with grapes growing up high which blocks the sun because you're in a very hot climate in the Nile Delta. So the, it's the Canaanites who are transplanting the grapevine to the Delta, setting up the winemaking industry there, and using very advanced uh, horticultural methods. They even had irrigation of single plants that we see in some of the illustrations. And of course, doing the stomping operation, putting it into jars, knowing how to seal it, how to, how to do the fermentation, and how to keep it. And, um, uh, this, uh, you know, is an influence that ultimately comes from Lebanon. We know from uh, the, uh, you know, the textual evidence of the Greeks and so forth that uh, Lebanese wine, especially uh, Bibline or Byblos wine, was renowned in the ancient world as being the equal of uh, any Greek wine. Like they said, it was comparable to the Lesbos uh, wine, and it was very much a part of uh, ceremonies in in Lebanon, we have from the Rosh Hashanah texts that they had special uh, worship and, and meals and uh, ceremonies for the ancestors, which uh, featured lots of wine, which also the gods, uh, Baal and El, sometimes overindulged in. Uh, so we've, we've got a culture there that uh, is definitely a wine-based culture, and, uh, and yet we know very little about it because we have not done any analyses of vessels from the homeland of Phoenician area uh, that we uh, can really rely on, uh, or at least there may be some in progress that uh, suggest cardamom, but I, I kind of wonder about that. Uh, but we've got these spectacular uh, vases, the mushroom-lipped uh, juglet and the amphoras and so forth that need to be analyzed. And on this particular uh, sarcophagus of Hiram of uh, Byblos, um, we see him holding a cup in his hand. And what was that cup filled with? Well, we, we would think it would be with wine, but uh, we still have yet to prove this. And, and we really need a lot more work and protection of the antiquities in, in Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McGovern. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Peter von Domlin. Uh, he's an archaeologist studying cross-cultural interactions and colonial connections in the ancient Mediterranean 
especially in the Phoenician and Punic worlds. His research concerns topics like my migration, rural households, ancient agriculture and landscapes in the, West, in the Western Mediterranean in both ancient and more recent times. They also struck, um, structure long-term fieldwork and ceramic studies on the island of Sardinia, uh, Italy. He is the Joukowsky Family Professor of Archaeology and Professor of Anthropology at Brown University in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, and has uh, held visiting professorships at the University of Valencia in Spain, the Beliarix in Spain, and Cagliari in Italy. Recent publications have appeared in the jour uh, Journal of Roman Archaeology, uh, Revista di Studi Fenici, and the Annual Review of Anthropology. They also include um, uh, Rural Landscapes of the P uh, Punic World uh, and the Cambridge Prehistory of the Bronze and Iron Age uh, Mediterranean. He also serves as co-editor of the Journal of Mediterranean Archaeology and World, uh, World Archaeology. Uh, Dr. Peter Van Zandt. Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. And of course, also my thanks to the uh, committee for Tyre, because it's uh, an honor to speak here, but also a great pleasure here to talk to you about Phoenician uh, archaeology. As um, you heard in the introduction, uh, I'm an archaeologist and working particularly on cultural interactions. So what happens when people migrate, go and work somewhere else, and how they learn things from other, how they start doing things in different ways, and, and in the process sort of come up with novel ways of, of doing that or consuming things as well. And um, most of my research over the sort of past 20, 25 years has been involving Phoenicians. But without going into Lebanon myself, um, which is still a place where I have to go, I must confess, uh, because all of my work, in fact, has been concentrated in the West Mediterranean, and that is what uh, I will be speaking about here. So it's under the heading of material connections, um, because the fame of Tyre is, as we've heard and we've seen to some extent, to a large extent, based on the city itself, of course, but not just and not only that. It's also on the overseas connections, what uh, Tyrians were doing overseas uh, and what they, were, well, what they were up to in those faraway places. And uh, archaeology is actually crucial for understanding these things. Archaeology is about stuff, about things that you find, and hence they make up these material connections. Um, while this is obviously, or because this is obviously, a huge and vast topic, um, I'm only going to be touching on uh, a couple of points today because of the constraints of time. And what I want to highlight is to take you on a kind of a uh, whirlwind tour across the West Mediterranean and highlight some of the rapid advances that the discipline of archaeology has been uh, making uh, in this regard as well, in re really in sort of recent years. And I'm beginning here straight away with this introductory slide, which uh, I'm not going to say much more about, other than you're looking at this wonderful view, uh, which is on the island, or just off the island of Sardinia, where at the peninsula in the background is the, uh, the, the colonial site of uh, Bitia. Southeast Sardinia, and we're looking at it from the Tofet, which is one of those weird sites that were created in the, um, in the Western Phoenician colonial world. And again, one of those things I don't have time to go into detail, but we may touch on it here or there. Tyre and its overseas connections then, um, because even, it's not just archaeology that gives us information about these, of course, as we've already seen in previous talks, there's all sorts of uh, iconographic uh, sources, illustrations of various kinds as we see here in these reliefs or in this uh, bronze uh, plate that sort of was originally fixed on a gate in, in Balawat, the Neo-Syrian period plate. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of literary sources. But even when we look at these epigraphic and uh, iconographic sources, we can see very well that they uh, show us lots of stuff, lots of things, the, the archaeology. We see uh, trees, timber uh, being uh, transported in forms of tribute. There's, we've just heard a lot about these uh, Cananean amphorae being transported. And to some extent, is the amphorae themselves the clay vessels. But of course, it wasn't just about the vessels. It was clearly, as we've heard, all about the contents of them. So there's a lot of these 
even if we look at non-material sources, it's sort of the material that sort of makes up those connections that's paramount there. But with archaeology, we can actually do something more, and that's more what I want to talk about. Sort of these material connections, they give us an insight in everyday life. We can talk about sort of what was life in those colonial uh, overseas settlements, and what were people uh, up there? How were they building their life in faraway places? So the places I want to sort of briefly touch on here is, of course, Carthage. How could we not talk about Carthage when we talk about the West? But as you can see there, a concentration on the island of Sardinia, which has all to do with that as the place where I conduct uh, my field work. But um, very important is, of course, the Spanish peninsula, that, the Iberian peninsula, where we haven't heard much about so far today. But it's the city of uh, Cadiz, situated, in fact, just outside the Mediterranean on the Atlantic shores. Uh, that is uh, a key element of this, um, of this Phoenician uh, Ty Tyrian expansion. So first, Carthage. Carthage, famously founded uh, by uh, Daida Elisa, and we'll hear uh, much more about it in a, in a later talk, as I gather from the program. And uh, we have from our literary sources, historical sources, a uh, traditional foundation date of 814 BCE. And there has been a long discussion whether that would be reliable, because most of the archaeology was coming up with somewhat younger dates. Uh, but in fact, it is excavations that have been carried out uh, first by the University of Hamburg and then more uh, recently by the universities of Amsterdam and Ghent in Belgium um, under this, at the site of the so-called Decumanus Maximus or Birma Suda that have actually come up with all different uh, kinds of evidence. Particularly it's from the uh, De Decumanus Maximus site that uh, recent uh, radiocarbon dates have actually been pushing back the sort of the first presence of settlement at that site to the end of the ninth century. So that sort of brings us within touching distance, as it were, of that sort of uh, traditional uh, foundation date. So that's sort of one important uh, achievement uh, that I would like to highlight. But it's this, what you see on the larger photo, which is sort of not particularly uh, enticing or sort of attractive, you might think. But it's sort of, in many ways, it is, because it's one of those industrial uh, or artisanal areas, in this case, a fairly early uh, uh, iron uh, working uh, site uh, at uh, ancient Carthage. Another important settlement site uh, where Phoenicians settled down very early is on the southeast uh, of the southwest, sorry, of the island of Sardinia. In fact, on a little island just off the island of Sardinia itself, the little island of Santioco, where the ancient site of Sulki uh, was established. Uh, right in the middle of the modern town, as you can see uh, on this uh, aerial, um, there's what you see, most of the remains are Roman period or Punic later and so on, but it's within that uh, highlighted area there. That's why there's one area where much older uh, foundations of a house were found, and particularly zooming in much more in detail uh, at those remains, we've actually got uh, foundations uh, of a house, probably possibly two houses here, uh, that were established in the early or mid 8th century. So that's a little bit later than the sort of evidence that we've been getting from Carthage. But here, uh, what was very important to establish as well, these were um, new foundations. There was nothing before that. These were established on an empty site. And um, the life <coughs> from the materials, as we can find, that people were living here, the kind of houses that they were building there, they seemed to be sort of fully fledged uh, Phoenician houses. And some of the pottery that sort of illustrates in that drawing there actually finds some very close matches uh, to material uh, known from Tyre. But what also should be noted here, Sardinia wasn't uh, empty, of course. The island was already inhabited by local Sardinians, the people, people of so-called Nuragic culture, and some of their material culture, some postures have been found within this early Phoenician context as well. Moving further west, really sort of into the far west uh, of the Mediterranean, if not just beyond, uh, as we're just outside the, the, the Straits of uh, Gibraltar in uh, Cadiz, uh, in and modern Andalusia. And here we're overlooking the area, the, the salt marshes, uh, the, the vast wetlands that sort of make up that part of the coast. There's been long, this has been long uh, an archaeological problem here because stray finds were turning up like this uh, little Phoenician statuette that was actually dragged up uh, from the sea, so without any precise foundation. So if you look it up in literature, 
uh, or on websites. And so you will find wildly uh, varying dates for this little statuette because by and large it cannot be dated with any precision. Various kinds of Phoenician amphorae clearly recognizable as such were turning up from various places but not with any sort of clear contexts. But all of this uh, has now sort of been changed in a very dramatic way uh, because of what really has been commercial excavations, salvage interventions uh, going on to do with uh, building within the historical town of Cadiz over the last 10 years or so, an evidence that has only sort of just uh, been published really. Um, and what's been found there at the site called the Teatro Comico, because uh, it's actually under this historical uh, theater in uh, downtown Cadiz, uh, that the whole Phoenician neighborhood basically has been brought to light. There's eight houses um, contained in three separate buildings with a street and a small side alley connecting to it, sort of connecting uh, them up. From the nature of the evidence, it's actually very clear that the build several of the buildings at least had several stories, as you can see in this reconstruction here. Um, the site has actually recently been made accessible to the public under the theater. So if any of you would happen to go to Andalusia, sort of Cadiz should definitely be a, a place uh, to go there. The excellent uh, state of preservation and excavation of this uh, evidence has clearly, very clearly demonstrated that people here were living Phoenician style. There's no less than five or six uh, tanurs, uh, bread ovens really to make this sort of flat bread uh, it have been found in those places there. Again, all of this dating to the very end of the 9th century, sort of early 8th century. So we're back at a very early date, coinciding roughly in time with the foundation of Carthage. And what's remarkable, therefore, at that very early date, um, people were already sort of going as far as the very edges of the Mediterranean, venturing out at least into the, uh, the opening up of the Atlantic. Um, so what we have here clearly, therefore, is a Phoenician migrant community setting themselves up not just for uh, making a few bucks uh, on the shoreline or exchanging something on the beaches or so. This is something totally different. This is a very substantial, well-established uh, uh, trading and migrant uh, settlement. What's interesting, though, and that's a little fragment you see in the middle of my slide there, is it's not just Phoenician material culture that's being found here. This, the pot that you see there, is uh, a vessel from the island of Sardinia, and interestingly, not a Phoenician one, but this is one, the uh, so-called Nuragic uh, jug that belongs uh, within the Nuragic Sardinian culture. So the island of Sardinia, sort of situated centrally in the West Mediterranean, is one of those important places, a very large island, one of the largest islands of the Mediterranean that really played a key role in the Phoenician expansion and its context, the creating of those contexts across uh, and spanning over the entire Mediterranean. And whilst you're, you're looking here at this uh, wonderful uh, bay, which is one of the best anchorages uh, in this part of the, the Mediterranean, um, this site and the next one that uh, I'll be talking about, these the two uh, dots that you see here, the sites of Santimbenia and of Suraki uh, actually have come up with evidence, and again in the last five to ten years, with evidence of a different mode uh, of being, a different mode of migrating and a different mode of, uh, of commercial interaction uh, within the Phoenician world that they've seen. Because these two sites, Santimbenia and Suraki, are not Phoenician settlements. These are indigenous, neuragic, Sardinian uh, settlements, but we've got clear evidence here of uh, Phoenician activities and in fact sort of fairly permanent uh, presence uh, in those sites. And in fact the amphora uh, that you see here is a local produced, it's, a, it's not a Canaanian jar, it's not a Phoenician amphora, it's locally produced, the type is sort of specific to Sardinia but it is clearly sort of based on uh, the Phoenician uh, prototypes. And this uh, type of jar is called Santimbenia jar because where it was first uh, recognized has actually been found in Carthage uh, itself as well and probably now in Spain too. And all of this goes together with all those other elements that make up these material connections. Uh, there's some Greek pottery, some very early Greek pottery, as you can see as well. We're talking here sort of end of the ninth century. So again, to, we're back to that very early uh, horizon of Phoenician expansion in the West. Um, and of course, those sort of uh, shapeless blocks that are lying at the foot of the amphora, these are uh, bronze, broken up bronze ingots. So again, sort of trade in metal uh, very well demonstrated here. This slide, 
uh, gives you an impression of uh, that side of Saint-Imbéni, you know, which you can clearly see this is sort of totally alien in a way to Phoenician uh, architecture because, in fact, it isn't. It is uh, what the site of Santimbenia looks like. It's typical Le Bronze Age, Iron Age architecture with all its specificities that I'm, I won't be going into. But what we're looking at is, therefore, uh, a Phoenician presence, Phoenician context that's, in this case, difficult to say, within a well-established uh, local context. For a better understanding of how that sort of embedding of those Phoenician contexts could work in um, in an Uragic Sardinian context, we'd need to look at this other site of Suraki, sort of lower down the west coast of Sardinia, uh, which is in fact the site where I'm directing an excavation project at the moment, and where we've got very extensive evidence of Phoenician material, like this uh, mushroom lid jar, which actually comes uh, from this site, and some other Greek and local material. But it's mostly through, and again, sort of connecting to the previous paper, through archaeometric, ceramological, technical, uh, scientific investigation where the pottery was made, but also through x-ray analysis, understanding how handles were shaped, how the pot itself was shaped, how rims were connected as well, but gives us an insight into the very small details of the skills of artisans, of the ceramic artisans, that has showed us actually that we've got, even if pots look like they are made, they are Sardinian style, or they are Phoenician style, we can see that we must have had um, masters and trainees of different cultural backgrounds because we can see a mixing up the body of the pot made in a Phoenician style, the pot made to look like a Phoenician cooking pot, for instance, but the handle or the rim made through with a uh, neuragic indigenous technique. So it's really sort of the kind of interactions that you can only get when people are sort of living and working together on the same place for quite a while. And I would wish to end here this uh, brief survey with another material dimension of what those connections are. It's actually the ships themselves. We've heard uh, about the Uruburun wreck. We've heard a reference to the San Rafael uh, wreck earlier. This is another sort of one that's just beginning to make uh, the, uh, the literature because it's so recent. This is one of two ships that were found just off the beach of Mazaron, uh, south of, um, sort of way bit south of Cartagena and um, Alicante on the Spanish uh, Mediterranean coast uh, that has been excavated and that sort of actually so dates to the 7th century and it gives us some material evidence as well. And it's associated with the sort of pottery that you see there. But the other object that you see on this slide is actually, it's a model, as you can see, of a boat. It's a little bronze model. Um, that comes, that is a typically Sardinian neuragic model. And I want to use this to connect back to what I've been you reminding of, is all this interaction that I've been talking about. Yes, the Phoenicians clearly were sailing the whole of the Mediterranean. They were setting up shop, literally, in many cases, on the other side of the Mediterranean, but they were not the only ones doing that. They didn't come venture into a Mediterranean where they were the first ones. And you can just remind yourself when you're going into those sometimes dangerous seas, particularly Straits of Gibraltar, some of those places, the Straits of Sicily, these are not easy seas uh, to navigate. Local knowledge, local pilots, local advisors have, must have been very important. And although we don't have any concrete evidence of neuragic or Iberian shipwrecks yet, I should add, I would hope to add, um, it is bronze models like this one that give us a little glimpse of those other indigenous native uh, skills, seagoing skills that have, must have existed and with whom Phoenicians uh, must have worked as well. And it's easily imaginable that just as been demonstrated for that Uluburun wreck in an earlier period, the crew was very much sort of culturally mixed and international. The same sort of must have uh, been true in uh, these later, uh, slightly later periods as well. So what I want to uh, conclude, therefore, on two points is that this brief survey of archaeological finds sort of uh, with the shipwrecks, sh again, underscores this conventional representation of the Phoenicians as skilled sailors and navigators. And particularly, the evidence of the Teatro Comico in Cadiz spells that out in great detail. But at the same time, the evidence, the Sardinian evidence of the local embedding of those Phoenician traders, travelers, and sailors as well as recognizing those Phoenician Santimbenia amphorae within Carthage in Spain shows us that it's highly unlikely that these Phoenicians were the only ones plying the seas of the Mediterranean in the early first millennium BC. 
And if we take all this together, therefore, the new evidence that's just been coming up in these last decades enriches the established accounts considerably by both detailing and by complicating our understanding of Phoenician overseas connections and interactions with West Mediterranean communities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Van Damelen. Um, our next speaker, uh, Mr. James Fitzpatrick, is a senior partner at the Washington law firm of Arnold and Porter. For many years, he was responsible. He was the the responsible partner for the legislative public policy uh, group in the firm. He was involved in major legislative proceedings uh, dealing with the auto safety issues. Uh, revision of national standards for copyright protection for the recording industry and professional sports, as well as the congressional hearings uh, defending officials of the Clinton administration, senior officials of major universities, and corporate leaders under fire from Congress. For 25 years, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick represented art dealers, museums, and collectors in legislative and judicial proceedings, establishing fundamental rules of law at federal and international level, uh, relating to the movement of antiquities and cultural properties around the world. For 10 years, he has taught a course at Georgetown Law School entitled Indiana Jones and the Elgin Marbles dealing with the legal system relating to, the cult to cultural properties. Mr. Fitzpatrick received his law degree from Indiana University Law School. He read economics at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and taught at the London School of Economics and Trinity College, Dublin. He has been a central player in the 1990s culture wars in which critics attempted to shut down federal support for the National Endowment of the Arts, those battles were fought in the Congress, the courts, and the press. Mr. Fitzpatrick has led a number of civil rights, civil liberties, and human rights organizations pressing for essential liberties under the law. Uh, Mr. James Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much. This has really been an intellectually uh, engaging morning. We've had wine. Uh, all of us can go home now tonight and have that third glass of wine, uh, feeling uh, that you've had history on your side. We've had the Bible, we've had archaeology, we've had, we're going to have numismatics. Uh, this has been really a, a quite uh, strikingly engaging uh, set of lectures. I must say that this presentation, the movies are over, folks. Uh, we're, we're, this is not going to be a slide presentation. We're going to go back to the 19th century uh, where, we uh, where we converse uh, verbally rather than visually. Now, one of the basic uh, laws of lawyering and advocacy is, uh, particularly when you're last on the program, uh, you never want to talk too long to a group of hungry judges and a hungry jury. And I'm sure, uh, Mary Jane, that's the same thing uh, here. I'll, I'll try and uh, try to be quick. Um, my assignment is not, in contrast to everyone else, tire specific. Uh, what I've been asked to talk about is, in a broader vector, law and antiquities. Uh, and this is a sprawling subject uh, involving international law, national law, US, EU law, uh, patrimony laws around the, the world, criminal and civil law, and the standards that are created uh, by museum associations and architectural associations. To get the full play of all this, you're going to have to come to Georgetown University and take my class, and I'd welcome you all there. I'm going to talk about basically two issues in this uh, quite uh, comprehensive field. One is the uh, law as it relates to or doesn't relate to this heartbreaking destruction uh, in the Mideast by ISIS, the Islamic State of Antiquities, and does the law 
what can the law do about that? The second thing I want to talk about briefly is the uh, law and repatriation of items uh, that are found in uh, museums and uh, collections around the world. Both of these are matters of uh, significant contemporary import. You, uh, one of the joys of teaching this class uh, at Georgetown is that I can uh, clip the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the art newspaper uh, every week and have something to talk uh, to my students uh, that is this week's news. So these are two topics uh, that I think illustrate the interplay of the law and the broad issue uh, of who owns the past. That ultimately, uh, to me, is one of the most uh, challenging issues. And it's played out uh, in, in the legal literature uh, in two, uh, two elements. One approach uh, to who owns the past is what is thought of as an international approach. The whole world has a stake in the culture of the world. This is not narrowly national. The second view is a source country, a country that produced material, have first dibs. Uh, to those materials, and they are not part of the common uh, heritage of mankind. This is a tough, ongoing issue, and I would tell you my bias, uh, having worked on the museum side of this issue and the collector and dealer side of this issue, I have a bias, and I will try to, as we go through here, tell you what's bias and what's fact, but uh, in this debate, which essentially pits uh, the museum and the collector community that supports the view that the world has a right uh, to antiquities on the one side, and essentially the archaeological community and the community of source countries. Um, uh, this is a very energetic debate that plays out uh, in, has played out in Congress, has played out at the State Department, plays out in the courts, plays out in the press, and plays out very dramatically in uh, professional organizations. And my uh, admonition to my students when we start this course is be very skeptical of anything anybody says in this area because everybody is coming at this question as to who owns the past with a point of view. I do, uh, when I bring in uh, archeologists to speak, uh, they have a point of view. This is an area to me that one has to, uh, in, uh, one has to impose uh, healthy skepticism about anyone's view. I don't think in this debate between uh, the museum community, let the borders be open, let's have free trade in objects, and an archaeological community which has a legitimate opposite view. I don't think anybody's 100% right and no one's 100% wrong. Let's talk about these uh, two issues. First, the issue of the return of iconoclasm uh, with the emergence of ISIS uh, and Taliban. And this isn't uh, an abstract question. You pick up the papers, particularly in the last two months, and in one sense, your heart breaks. Uh, it's what, what's happened at some of these uh, treasures in uh, Iraq and Syria. In Mosul, the, the, tomb, the tomb of Jonah, uh, the museums where you had uh, pictures uh, of uh, ISIS fighters going in with uh, sledgehammers, uh, breaking down uh, objects, uh, the uh, Negral Day Gate where uh, the ISIS uh, people were taking jackhammers to uh, these beautiful uh, statues, uh, statues which you see also happily, uh, safely in the Met. Um, in Syria, five of six World 
heritage sites have been significantly damaged. Uh, the ISIS has just gone into Palmyra, and there is no indication of specifically of the damage that's uh, already happened there, but at a moment's notice, uh, some of the great treasures of humanity uh, could be destroyed. Earlier, you had the same uh, issues played out in Kabul, uh, where the Taliban went into the uh, museum there with hammers and destroyed uh, non-Islamic uh, items. And then you had this totally unbelievable moment where rocket launchers were aimed at the uh, majestic statues of Bamiyan and, and destroyed uh, statues of Buddha that were 160 and 140 feet high, reduced, reduced to rubble. Uh, the rationale is, uh, this is, this is a, uh, by my lights at least, this is the rationale of a zealot. This uh, short quote came from a transcription of a YouTube, of a, uh, transcription, a transcription of a tape uh, that described the, uh, the destruction. The ruins that, that are behind me, they are idols and statutes that people in the past used to worship instead of Allah. They so, the so-called Assyrians and others looked to gods for war, agriculture, and rain to whom they offered sacrifices. The prophet Muhammad took down idols with his bare hands when he went into Mecca. Mecca. We were ordered by our prophets to take down idols and destroy them. Uh, when God orders us to remo remove and destroy them, it becomes easy for us and we don't care even if they cost millions of dollars. That, I don't think that this is anything other than the narrow view of the people re uh, wreaking the hammers. Huge numbers of scholars and uh, wise uh, commentators from the Muslim community have, de have deplored this destruction. But this is the animating sense uh, behind that they are doing, uh, uh, in an ecumenical sense, they're doing the Lord's work by, uh, uh, de by destroying these, these items. Now, the, the question is, Oh, one, one point, nobody in the West can be overly sanctimonious uh, about this. We all recall Cromwell going into Ireland and desecrating and destroying statues uh, in, in Catholic churches. And we all recall in the 19th century, the British and French armies going into Beijing and absolutely destroying the Summer Palace. So this sense of idolatry and sanctimony uh, is not limited to any one group, but it is, a, it is an animus, it's an impetus that has to be uh, resisted. Uh, this sort of bigotry and uh, absolutism uh, is the, the most potent element in destroying uh, the world's culture. Now, there are three issues going, by my lights, there are three issues going on in this fight. One is the religious impetus. Second, I think this is, this element of destruction is a way to exercise power and to terrify the populace that is uh, being uh, overtaken. One is beheading statutes uh, just as one is beheading individuals. It is a power play to press into submission uh, the people that are uh, the, the people in the territory which you've overtaken. The third element is an economic element. There's been a lot of uh, press about the fact that the ISIS has taken small items, uh, small objects, and put them into the black market. Uh, but I don't think that the reality is that that's what's uh, uh, funding ISIS today. There's oil, there's money coming from supporting countries. We all know that in the commerce of the black market of antiquities, the people that got it out of the ground and the people that get, gave it to the first traders get a pittance. It ain't got big dollars till it gets to the West End or the Upper East Side. So I think though economics is, is one rationale to me, that is not uh, the, the critical 
issue. Now, the, the question is, what can the law do about this? Can it stop the, de the destruction? The sad reality is that legal institutions, uh, international legal institutions, have little power uh, to stop this destruction. There are some high-minded international conventions, the Hague Convention of 1954, uh, a UNESCO convention talking about every nation has the responsibility to guard cultural uh, properties. That is really, in this situation, cheap talk. Uh, there is no effective, there is no effective enforcement mechanism uh, to go in and stop uh, this, uh, this destruction. Uh, it ultimately is going to be, uh, and this is not the kind of world we would like it to be, uh, it ultimately is going to be a matter of who wins the hearts and minds and the military. Uh, is this going to be a military and political solution, not a legal solution? There are some things that can be done via the law. One thing is you can have either an international or a national embargo against the import of any of these items that might be smuggled out of uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria. That uh, will only work if it's international. With an international market, it does no good to close down the markets on 57th Street in New York if there's a thriving market in, uh, in the Emirates or in London or in Paris. There, there has to be an international response, but there can be some efforts beyond rhetoric to try to deal after the fact uh, with the consequences of the destruction and looting. And once, one, once something is found, then uh, it's clearly a candidate to be sent back. If something's actually intercepted by customs, it isn't the easiest thought uh, in the world of where you send it back. Do you really want to send something back uh, to, uh, to Syria at this point, uh, or do you hold it? My, my preference would be you, you make clear this is Syrian or this is Iraqi and you hold it for the moment until one's assured that it can go back to a safe, to a safe venue. Uh, the, there are also some extra legal steps and though this is not directed to this, to this specific geography of what we're talking about, this is a step that any nation which ha is endangered uh, with the kind of override that we've seen in the Mideast, uh, it requires a very careful inventory of what's in the museum. That wasn't in the Baghdad Museum when it was looted. No one could really figure out what was there. One needs a process of uh, inventory and one needs a, a, an emergency plan. Many museums have found their treasures have been saved because they've been taken out of the museum and sent uh, to some safe place. It's much like the Louvre uh, in the Second World War uh, where the treasures in, in the Louvre were, were removed uh, uh, and, and sent around the French countryside uh, to safety. So that part uh, of my discussion ends on sort of a, a cautious note. Uh, there isn't, the, the law uh, is great in terms of principle. Uh, the law in this particular area is not very good in terms of uh, execution and stopping. Very quickly, I just want to note about the reparation uh, issue. I'm sure many of you have read and followed the great controversy between the Met and the Getty and Italy and Greece on some objects uh, that were bought in very shady circumstances uh, by both the Met uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the Getty, where it was essentially look the other way and don't worry too much about prov provenance. These are such beautiful objects that justifies their buying. The basic legal rule 
The basic legal rule as set down by international conventions is that a nation where an object is found has control over it, has ownership over it. And that's very easy to define, but as a matter of policy, it's not that clear it's the right rule. Um, what if the nation where something is found has no cultural connection with the object itself? It's found in the Mideast, which is the product of political boundaries that were uh, designed in uh, right after the First World War. What if there is no connection between Turkey and Ephesus? There's an economic connection, but there's no cult cultural connection between the Ottoman Empire and uh, the, the Greek and Roman uh, treasures in Ephesus. D does Turkey have first dibs uh, to those objects? What happens uh, where you have a country that doesn't have the capacity to take care of an object or has no interest in taking care of an object. For a long time, the Elgin Marbles debate turned on the issue of whether there was a, an adequate uh, resource in, uh, in Athens uh, to take care of the Elgin Marbles. That's all been preempted now with the construction of a magnificent 21st, 22nd century museum there. Third and finally, what happens where a nation should a nation have control and ownership of an object, of objects which are abhorrent to the people that are living there? Do they really have uh, first dibs uh, on those objects? My own view on repatriation, and this is, this is bias, this isn't fact, um, is that one ought to approach uh, questions of repatriation cautiously and work through the issues of whether or not the nation, the country where one is, uh, where one is uh, sending it has authority. Uh, the hook has come. I've got to stop. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've enjoyed talking with you. If, someone, if, we, if anybody wants to continue uh, uh, arguing or archaeologists want to punch me in the nose, uh, we'll be around at lunchtime. Thank you all very much. You've been a tremendously patient and um, very fine audience, and we are now in our third panel in this extremely interesting uh, conference on the ancient and medieval and Byzantine city of Tyre. Uh, most people in the United States at least know of Tyre through the biblical narratives, and so it's only fine that we have our last panel on the Bible and on art. Now, our first speaker is Professor Mohammed Fantar, who is an expert in Western Semitic languages and Middle East civilizations, especially Phoenicia and its colony of Carthage. He is the former Director General of the National Institute of Archaeology and Art of Tunis from 1982 to 1987. He is the Director of Research at the Insti Institut National de Patrimoine, uh, and INP, and the Director of the Phoenician Punic Civilization Studies Center and Libyan Antiquities Center. Professor Fantar is the founder of Repal, is that it? Magazine that publishes the research papers of that center. He is also professor of ancient history, archaeology, and religious history at the Tunis and Zituna universities. I'd like to re uh, welcome uh, Professor Mohamed Fantar, who will be delivering his lecture, Tire et la Méditerranée, les faits et les mythes, uh, and the lecture will be translated. Thank you so much. Mesdames, Messieurs, c'est l'heure de la sieste. It's time Donc, for the break. Je peux me permettre quand même de vous entretenir, entretenir votre digestion par ces quelques mots sur. Car les Phéniciens ont toujours fait rêver. Et on rêve avec les Phéniciens. Et les Phéniciens ne se ne se contente pas de rêver, mais il réalise. The Phoenicians uh, dream, and they pull us into their dream as well, and it is uh, necessary to dream with them to enjoy the trip, I think. 
Et euh, je vais essayer de vous présenter Tyr au cœur de la Méditerranée, telle qu'elle qu est visible à travers la mythologie, d'une part, et les faits historiques, d'autre part. Um, I will uh, try to uh, present Tyre to you uh, in all its importance in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, on one side, in uh, relation to the mythology, and on the other side, on the archaeological evidence, uh, the sites in the Mediterranean. Mais je ne peux pas commencer mon discours avant de remercier ceux qui nous ont offert cet espace sacré cette bibliothèque du Congrès qui nous accueille. Et évidemment, pour nous tous, je crois que c'est un honneur, un signe, et nous devons le reconnaître à sa juste valeur. Et donc, avant que je commence mon discours, je voudrais remercier cette sacrée librairie pour m'inviter à faire cette lecture. Et je ne peux pas non plus éviter de remercier du fond du cœur Madame Charabi, qui est vraiment la cheville ouvrière de cette rencontre, qui s'avère déjà d'une fécondité absolument exceptionnelle, où le nord et le sud se rencontrent, un, et, et j'espère qu'ils feront un bon mariage. And uh, I mostly would like to thank Mrs. Charabi for having invited me to this uh, place and for having joined uh, the north and the south, and hopefully this joining. Will lead to a marriage. Alors, Tyr dans la mythologie, c'est déjà vers l'an 1000 avant Jésus-Christ, il y avait un historien de Beyrouth qui a raconté une histoire des Phéniciens, des, de ce qu'ils appelaient déjà les Cananéens, ils n'étaient pas encore Phéniciens. So, the, uh, so uh, Tyr in the mythology, uh, during the period when we were still talking about Canaanites and not Phoenicians. Et cet, ce, cet historien mythologue s'appelait, euh, il s'appelait Sanconiaton. Sanconiaton signifie le, le don de Sakun. Sakun est une grande divinité phénicienne. Sakuniaton. So, Vous trouvez ici le verbe yatan ou natan qui signifie donner. So the first uh, evidence goes back to San Chiaton, who is the first uh, uh, reference for the Phoenician uh, presence and for the Canaanite existence. San Chiaton nous parle d'Ousos. Ousos est un héros tyrien qui un jour il eut un incendie. Alors il a eu peur, il prit un arbre. Il enleva une branche et il l'enfourcha, et c'est ainsi que commença l'aventure phénicienne en Méditerranée. So we are discussing two ouais. characters, two brothers, Uzos and Ipsuranios, and these two brothers uh, uh, um, uh, managed to start the first phase of uh, Phoenician exploration in the Mediterranean. C'est vraiment le début d'une épopée, l'épopée phénicienne en Méditerranée, d'est en ouest. So it's the first step of a Mediterranean, of a, of a uh, ship traveling from east to west. Puis, nous avons un autre mythe très sympathique, puisqu'il s'agit d'un en, en, en enlèvement d'une femme. Zeus, un jour, a vu, a été touché par la beauté d'une de, de, des filles du roi de Tyr, la fille d'Agenor, qui s'appelait Europe. So we, uh, we, we witness the uh, kidnapping of a Tyrian princess called Europa, and uh, she is uh, lured and uh, kidnapped by Zeus, uh, the god, Because of her beauty. Je ne veux pas vous raconter l'histoire parce qu'elle est longue et passionnante, elle nous retient, mais je dis simplement que ce, cet enlèvement, au fond, est un symbole, un symbole de, du mariage entre la Phénicie et la Grèce, entre l'Orient et l'Occident, ce qui va donner 
cette fécondité énorme de la Méditerranée à l'est et à l'ouest. And so we, I am not going to do the whole, uh, go through the entire love story uh, that is related to uh, uh, both uh, Europa and Zeus, but it is a symbol for the joining, for the connection between the East, uh, Europa, uh, the, um, the princess, the Tyrian princess, and Zeus uh, representing Greece. So the joining between East and West. Zeus, on le voit, la fille, la, be la beauté phénicienne, puis ensuite il s'en alla en Crète. Là, il se maria avec euh, Europe et euh, elle a disparu. Cette Europe a disparu dans le fond de la Grèce. On a l'impression qu'au fond, cette fusion entre la Phénicie et la Grèce va donner ce que plus tard les, la pensée occidentale va appeler le miracle grec. So the, uh, the uh, kidnapping of uh Europa towards Greece uh, led to a uh, um, myth and to a story around the, this uh, beautiful princess. And uh, so it, it represents this uh, um, connection and it is of uh, high importance to all the uh, upcoming uh, um, uh, historians. Aguinor furieux, il somma son fils Cadmos d'aller chercher sa sœur et de ne revenir en Phénicie qu'avec sa sœur. Autrement, il, resta, il devait rester là-bas. So, Agenor, le roi, uh, uh, asks son his, uh, his, uh, son, uh, Cadmus, le frère de la princesse, de rentrer, de la suivre et de la chercher et de ne pas retourner à Phénicie sans la trouver. Et vous allez voir comment, au fond, ces, ces noms mythologiques expriment une réalité. Kadmos signifie l'oriental, celui qui vient de l'Orient. Kedem, en hébreu et en phénicien, signifie l'Orient, le Levant, donc le Levantin. Et Europe, c'est l'Occident. Donc, le, 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 au fond, le lever du soleil et le coucher du soleil vont se joindre et vont faire un miracle extraordinaire. So the word uh, Kadmus actually represents the Oriental man or the Orientalist. Um, and the word comes from the Hebraic uh, Kadam, GDM. And uh, Europa, on the other hand, uh, represents Europa. And so the rise of the sun from the east and towards the west, the sunset, is uh, very symbolic of this uh, story. Ce mythe de Cadmos et d'Europe a été chanté partout, d'abord par les, les mythologues, par les historiens, comme, par les poètes, comme Ovid. Ovid a chanté les amours d'Europe de, et, de, et de Jupiter, pour lui, mais us. Et on, on va trouver ça dans, à travers pratiquement tout l'art grec depuis le VIe siècle jusqu'à jusqu pratiquement aux peintres le plus récent qui n'ont pas cessé de reproduire ce mythe tellement il est fécondateur. So this myth, this legend became the subject of many ancient historians and uh, thinkers and even poets such as uh, Ovid and uh, it even continued to be a subject of study uh, towards uh, the uh, late uh, period until the 20th century. Et Hérodote a rendu hommage à Cadmos parce que Cadmos a introduit l'alphabet dans le monde grec. So Herodotus in the 5th century introduced uh, Cadmus uh, to uh, his readers because he brought the alphabet to the Greeks. Et Cadmus devait vivre seul, loin de, la, de sa patrie, en Grèce, dans un pays étranger. Donc, par conséquent, c'est à la fois non seulement l'alphabet qui était une invention phénicienne diffusée, mais aussi, surtout, plus important, Cadmus, c'est l'individu qui se forge et qui ne dépend plus de la, la tribu ou de la fratrie. Et l'individu, cette invention de l'individu est sans doute la plus grande invention dans l'histoire de l'humanité parce que c'est à elle que nous devons la citoyenneté. Il n'y a pas de citoyen sans l'individu. So the fact that Cadmus left Phoenicia and went to Greece on his own and was away from his 
fatherland for a very long time, meant that he adopted uh, uh, a uh, different mentality that he became an individual. And the fact that he's a unique individual and that he uh, created a whole process by introducing the language is something extraordinary. And um, there is no individual without, uh, there is no country without the effort of one individual. Mon texte est long, je ne veux pas le lire, mais je vais juste passer aux historiens. J'ai passé, j'ai présenté Tyr dans la mythologie, maintenant en histoire, qu'en est-il Nous avons commencé par la transition avec Cadmos, l'alphabet et l'individu, mais ensuite, ce sont les sources, comme l'Ancien Testament, qui va aussi, à sa manière, les prophètes et les, et les écrivains de l'Ancien Testament ont, vont, à leur, à leur manière, chanter aussi ce que Tyr représentait euh, et que cette coopération entre finalement les Cananéens et les, les Hébreux qui, qui est matérialisé par le temple, ce temple qui a été commandité par Salomon et réalisé par des architectes tyriens et par le bois importé de, de Phénicie par les tyriens pour faire ce que nous connaissons tous dans les livres des rois et dans d'autres livres de l'Ancien la, Testament, cette grandeur architecturale. Et pratiquement, c'est l'introduction de l'architecture organique en, dans ce monde des Hébreux qui était plutôt nomade. Et Salomon lui-même le reconnaissait. Il demanda à, à, son, à son homonyme, son collègue et ami, euh, Iram, car c'était à l'époque l'amitié entre Israël et les Phéniciens. Et j'espère que cette amitié ne tardera pas à revenir pour que nous puissions ensemble construire un monde meilleur. So, so to um, translate and make it as short as possible, the, uh, in the Old Testament, we have proof of the uh, importance of uh, um, uh, Tyre through the fact that uh, um, the Old Testament mentions the uh, Temple of Solomon being built by cedar wood that was given by uh, 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 David and that this, uh, uh, I, 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 got, I got mixed up now. Uh, so so the, the, the wood is coming all the way from Lebanon and uh, Tyre has a very important role in that process. And so, yes. Oui, les équipages de Tyre et, et les équipages de Salomon vont parcourir les mers, vont jusqu'à Ophir, chercher l'or d'Ophir. On a même trouvé une inscription qui parle de l'or d'Ophir du, euh, du côté, je crois, de Jérusalem. So the uh, Phoenicians and the Tyrians have a very important role as well by traveling from Tyre towards Ophir and uh, to Jerusalem in order to, to bring gold from, uh, from the temple. Ils arrivèrent jusqu'en Espagne avec, avec Tartessos, pour les, les Espagnols prononcer Tartessos, à la manière grecque, d'après Hérodote. Mais la Bible parle de Tarshish, le pays de Tarshish, le pays lointain vers lequel appareillaient les navires phéniciens qui, à ce moment-là, circulaient d'est en est, sont en ayant des, des points d'appui de, euh, tout le long de la Méditerranée, depuis l'Espagne à Cadix, jusqu'à, bien entendu, Carthage. Et Carthage va diffuser le, le savoir, le savoir-faire des Phéniciens dans toute la Méditerranée occidentale. So, basically, they not only travel their Middle Eastern coast, they also travel towards Spain, towards Cadix, and uh, towards uh, uh, Carthage, and they uh, diffused, they dispersed the Phoenician uh, tradition. Tout à l'heure, vous avez vu, d'après les collègues qui m'ont précédé, vous avez vu des, des inscriptions un peu partout dans le monde. C'est des caractères phéniciens. Vous savez, jusqu'à présent, on, 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 les, ce sont les phéniciens qui ont fait le, les, inventé l'écriture alphabétique avec Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Dalet, etc., Et les Grecs ont adopté Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. C'est absolument la même ordonnance. 
Et c'était une époque absolument merveilleuse. Il, il y a émulation, il y a, disons, euh, un peu de jalousie, mais jamais de rupture et jamais de heur, car le, le, le rupture, la violence, est contre le développement économique. So, as we heard uh, my predecessors talking about the inscriptions, uh, the Phoenician inscriptions that are spread all over the Mediterranean, we see the, uh, the similarity between the Phoenician language and the first three letters versus the Greek language and the first three letters that are A, A, B, and G, as well as uh, the same in the Greek version. So we uh, have an incredible assimilation of Phoenician culture and Phoenician language. Il n'y a pas un pays méditerranéen où il n'y a pas une empreinte phénicienne avec un texte, avec un objet, avec... Et ça remonte à, à, vers à l'an 1200 avant Jésus-Christ, avec la, la, parce que euh, avec, le, là, avec l'âge de la, du fer, vers 1200, des inventions importantes ont été réalisées. La quille, les membrures, donc construction navale qui font un navire capable de supporter la pression des vagues et de traverser, de couper les eaux pour aller là où le Phénicien veut avoir. L'histoire est longue, passionnante, celle du Phénicien. Je ne peux pas m'attarder davantage car on m'appelle à l'ordre. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. <rires> Dix minutes Ah, oui, oui, oui. oh, mais euh, bon, <rire> écoutez, il paraît que je me suis trompé. Il, j'ai encore dix minutes, mais je ne veux pas vous imposer mon discours. Je laisse la, la, la partie à la... <rire> Je continue. Oui, oui. Bon, écoutez. Oui, oui, bon, dix minutes. Très bien. Donc, euh, évidemment, je vais, je, vais, je vais reprendre avec la fondation de Carthage, la reine de la Méditerranée. La reine de la Méditerranée, parce que Carthage, c'était le, vraiment le, l'étape principale. C'est là où on a eu, vous savez, tout à l'heure je parlais de l'individu et de la citoyenneté, c'est à, c'est à Carthage où on a sûrement la première démocratie dans l'histoire de, de, de l'humanité. Je ne... Je, je, dis, je dis ça sur la base d'une lecture de texte bien avant Athènes. Carthage a été une république avec euh, Aristote au IVe oui. siècle avant Jésus-Christ. Oui. Il en a fait l'éloge en disant qu'après avoir étudié les différentes dé, euh, dé, euh, dé, euh, constitutions, il a dit « je préfère » Aristote disait « je préfère celle de Carthage parce qu'elle est plus équilibré. Bon. So with the uh, Phoenician uh, 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 traveling, they uh, arrived to Carthage, and Carthage is a very unique site because it is the first, it is one of the first democracies or the first democracy in the world, <coughs> and even Aristotle himself supposedly said that he prefers the, uh, the, the uh, political system of Carthage because it is more balanced. Than his own. Et on peut suivre donc cette aventure phénico-punique, c'est-à-dire phénicien et Carthage ensemble. Carthage qui va diffuser tout le savoir phénicien, pas seulement le savoir phénicien, mais le savoir de l'Orient ancien. Parce que souvent, nous autres Méditerranéens, quand on parle de la Méditerranée, on oublie tout ce qui nous est arrivé de Mésopotamie, ce pays actuellement soumis à la sauvagerie des islamistes. So what we find is in Carthage not only a Phoenician tradition but a, a Middle Eastern tradition including the traditions that come from the Mesopotamian world and that uh, what is uh, happened what happened in Carthage is uh, is um, er- proves that the, the, tra- the, the Mediterranean, the Middle Eastern world had its uh, uh, um, expansion there, contrary to what is happening now with the oui. Islamists and how they are destroying it. Dans le creux de leur navire, les Phéniciens ont transporté toute l'expérience orientale, 
celle de Mésopotamie, que le monde à Sumer. Tout à l'heure, quelqu'un des de conférenciers a signalé, a, a évoqué le nom d'Ebla. Ebla, c'est quelque chose d'émouvant. Ebla, au quatrième, à la fin du, du quatrième millénaire et au début du troisième millénaire, Ebla avait un palais avec la bibliothèque du roi et on a, dit, on a, dit, on a dénombré plus de 16 000 tablettes. Ces tablettes, maintenant, sont déposées dans un musée vraiment menacé. Que vont devenir ces tablettes d'Ebla si elles viennent à disparaître L'humanité aura perdu une bonne partie d'elle-même. And so, if we are talking about Mesopotamia, we he would like to highlight the uh, evidence found in Ebla, in the site of Ebla, and the uh, um, the tablets that are found there, and their importance and the danger that they are been um, uh, inflicted to, uh, because uh, these the loss of these these tablets would be a loss for humanity. Devant moi, il y a une Syrienne. Et la Syrie, quand on pense à la Syrie, on pense à ces, aux grandes métropoles de l'humanité, qu'il s'agisse d'Ebla, que je viens de citer, qu'il s'agisse de Marie, qu'il s'agisse d'Ougarit, qu'il s'agisse de tel ou tel autre site. Palmyre elle-même était une grande métropole. Vous voyez ce que l'Orient a donné à la civilisation universelle et les Phéniciens ont été chargés de, de transporter tout ça d'Orient en Occident dans le creux de leur navire. Ils vont arriver jusqu'à Cadix où ils vont introduire l'architecture, le plan orthogonal des cités. Souvent, on, on, on l'attribue à Hippodamos de Milet. Hippodamos de Milet vivait au, à la fin du VIe siècle et au début du Ve siècle avant Jésus-Christ. Alors que, le, alors que le, le plan orthogonal remonte au deuxième millénaire déjà à Mohenjo Daro. Et alors, passer en Phénicie, passer d'abord dans les villes sumériennes, les villes syriennes, les villes phéniciennes, et arriver jusqu'à chez nous, en Méditerranée occidentale. Et quand je vois, par exemple, cette architecture grecque, je ne peux pas ne pas penser à Gilgamesh. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. So our next speaker, Dr. Eric Gubel, who is the General Director of the Royal Museums of Art and History. He has authored more than 150 contributions to the history, art history, and archaeology of the Phoenician civilization. He was the co-editor of the Studia Phoenicia collection, as well as the Dictionnaire de la Civilisation Phénicienne et Punique and coordinator of the publication of Phoenician sculpture in the Louvre. As an expert for UNESCO, he repatriated several antiquities stolen during the Civil War back to Beirut. He is now coordinating several international scientific projects, preparing the addition of the final reports of the American University of Beirut excavations led by Dr. Laila Badra at Tel Kazel, and more recently, Tyre. Besides a monograph on Phoenician seals and a second one on Phoenician art and how to read it, and he has found time nevertheless to come to us to speak. Please, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, I would uh, also like to thank uh, the authorities of the Library of Congress and, uh, of course, uh, Maha for bringing us here. Shukran, thank you all very much. Um, this lecture is about King, yes. King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, uh, belonging to the first temple period, was constructed in honor, not of Yahweh, but in honor of the name of God in line with the biblical and iconical tradition. Its iconical, uh, its iconical uh, value stands out as one of the mightiest metaphors of the pre-classical world. On its turn, the Freemasons tradition also emphasizes the role of Hiram son of the widow, as the Tyrian king Hiram's tradition, um, architect who eventually realized Solomon's ambitious building project, which lasted seven years. In doing so, he also introduced uh, the Ashler masonry technique uh, Phoenician architects uh, used as a legacy of the past since several generations. 
Both the biblical sources uh, as well as the Judeo-Christian iconography have yielded lots of representations of the temple and its cultic furnishings based merely on um, descriptions in the book of uh, Kings, invariably in the absence, total absence of actual remains, so most of them entirely fictitious. In the present paper, I would like to emphasize the importance of the uh, archaeological documentation from Hiram's homeland. It's time to bring this in to the discussion. Um, documentation pertaining to the engineering and designing skills of his specialized labor. If the latter, no doubt, um, traveled over land, the cedar logs uh, had to be shipped via cabotage from the southern Phoenician coastal strip to the biblical land of Kabul, present-day Galilee, um, where 20 settlements uh, were later granted by Solomon to Hiram of Tyre as part of his um, investment in the project. In this context, the archaeological site of Harvat uh, Rosh Zaid is a very likely candidate indeed for the identification with Kabul, uh, Kabul and its role as a halting place for the cedar beams transport to Jerusalem. This is not only suggested by the layout of a fortress and a small sanctuary in situ, but as well by the presence of uh, cedar locks numerous Phoenician oil containers and uh, several Phoenician artifacts. Now, in order to supply new data on today's topic, we will now uh, review several items documenting a plausible reconstruction of the Jerusalem temple. These fall into three main groups, namely architectural elements, decorative friezes, and last uh, but not least, the temple's Celtic furnishings. And I start with, as you can see on your slide, balustrated windows. Um, so as for the first case example, I refer to the description of uh, the Solomonic uh, Temple's wind, uh, windows and those uh, of his nearby pa um, banquet palace called the House of the Forests of the Lebanon. The latter specified uh, specifies the Shekufim Atumim, pardon my French. In other words, the balustrated windows to be, and here we go again, Shalosh Pe Amim, etymologically three times, which resulted in very confusing and contradictory translations of the Old Testament. But if we are indeed uh, allowed to translate triple instead of three times, and uh, the description becomes a straightforward reference to the typical Phoenician window base with their triple recessed embrasures. Such windows are depicted on dozens of 9th, 8th century um, Phoenician ivories, serving as some equivalent to the Egyptian window of appearances, here, however, reserved to Phoenician goddesses of the Astarte type like the villain uh, Jezebel, um, who Isaiah called, uh, or about whom Isaiah said, thou hast the forehead of a whore. She did not have a hole in her forehead, but she was wearing these jewels on her forehead, which characterized her as a priestess, a priestess of Baal, of course. So it's funny that uh, Solomon uh, would already have uh, windows decorated in the style, the Phoenician style of the Tyro Sidonian uh, kingdom, with a straightforward reference to the cult of Baal. Who are we? The false window of a Sidon born deceased buried in Paphos. Um, sorry, no, uh, this was one. Much. Uh, yeah. No, I, I was just um, calling, attention, calling your attention on the fact, you see the, 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 um, the pilasters 
um, have the form of floral, coral eye with drooping leaves, detail, also characterizing a set of bronze accessories, uh, not only used, uh, as you can see here, as lampstands and torch holders, but also as braseros for roasted meat, libation, and incense offerings within the walls of sanctuaries and banquet halls all over the Phoenician Mediterranean. Uh, Mediterranean. The false window of a Sidon uh, born deceased buried in Paphos, Cyprus, is of the same type and although less detailed, we should uh, add the depiction of uh, Sidon's windowed uh, buildings at the time of Sennacherib's third campaign. In 1, King, 1 Kings 6.29, we learn that Solomon, and I quote, decorated the walls of the house, the temple, round about with carved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers. This description clearly points to sculptured and possibly also painted friezes, um, since one picture tells more than a thousand words. I am showing you here a typical 9th century, 8th century BC Phoenician ivory strip, which represents exactly, exactly in all details what the biblical text uh, refers to. And I will add a bit to uh, the argument. Uh, when uh, the text further expands on the open flowers, the open flowers are, of course, the lotus flowers opening up and used for friezes in, again, uh, 9th, 8th century BC Phoenician art. <coughs> there is also um, Ezekiel who learns us that the temple's door jams were uh, decorated with uh, timorim um, on either side. Such capitals, nicknamed proto aeolic are abundantly attested in many sites south of the Carmel, including Jerusalem, but also uh, at Ramet Rahel in combination with ashlar masonry and triple recessed windows. And I think I have, yes, uh, I have some slides. Um, considering the fact that uh, the same combination is attested in the Phoenician realm, as attested here, more precisely, at the entrance of a royal tomb at Tamasos, uh, Cyprus, the often repeated qualification of the proto aeolic uh, capital as a typical Israelite invention can no longer be sustained. Um, you all remember, of course, from uh, the Book of Kings, the, the, the um, uh, detailed description of the cherubim whose uh, uh, wings overlapped. This, of course, are the typical uh, winged sphinxes used in uh, Phoenician cabinet making. And a nice example figures, of course, on the coffin of Ahiram, king of uh, Byblos, who reused a uh, relieved sarcophagus of the 12th century BC, around 1000 uh, BC. Um, his forefather is represented on the throne, which is flanked by the two winged sphinxes, um, who were actually the prefiguration of the cherubim of the Solomonic Temple. Now, also, uh, please your attention for, oh no, I can point this out here on the, no, it's not a touch screen, sorry, um, on the footstool. The footstool, uh, if you have a look at the footstool, you will say, hey, this resembles these proto aeolic uh, capitals, for yes, indeed, here is another prototype of what we found, what we find some generations later on in the Solomonic Temple, because it was constructed by a Phoenician archi architect. And then we also have this tripod table, and this tripod table was still used in the third temple of Jerusalem. And now we are in the first century BCE. This is a Hashmonian coinage of Herodes the Great, uh, the, uh, the Great, and you see a tripod table. 
a typical Phoenician invention which was still connected with all kinds of um, uh, temple furnishings. And uh, already in the early first millennium BCE, as can be seen on this Pyxis, um, inspired on a Phoenician prototype, uh, the, the, the Sphinx throne, the Cherubim uh, throne, was always uh, associated with a footstool and a tripod. And this uh, gives us the uh, origin of <coughs> a type of uh, cultic item used throughout the first millennium by Phoenician artists. This is a typical Phoenician. And now we are going to um, present another cultic item which is associated with uh, the temple, namely the cupboards. Cupboards, um, here we have a tiny ivory plaque from the 9th century BCE, which can be perfectly well dated because of uh, the form of the black on red traglet, which is represented at the top of it, classical Egyptian type. On the right you have um, the Egyptian prototype. Well, this type of cupboard, which was used to chest libation vases, uh, vases used for uh, ritual libations, uh, also figures on one of the reliefs of Karatepe uh, around uh, 700 BC. Um, our colleague uh, Francois already showed you the Phoenician inscriptions. It was indeed a, a site in Cilicia on the very strong Phoenician influence. So here we have this uh, cupboard. And what is funny about the cupboard it is that it's placed upside down. You see the round, the whole round uh, segment, which actually should be uh, the roof the roof of a tent, like the tent of the tabernacle, is placed upside down. One might think that this is uh, due to the hand of a yet an experienced uh, sculptor. Were it not that on the stele of Tel Daphna in the Eastern Delta, uh, a priest, an officiating priest, is standing on a cupboard of exactly the same type and reversed once, uh, once again, tête bêche, as we say in uh, French. So uh, this means that um, we are dealing here with uh, a Phoenician interpretation of an Egyptian cupboard, which is datable to roughly 700 uh, BC. And the question is if cupboards of this type were already used in the temple. And here I'm going to skip a chapter um, not to raise any suspicion, yes? Yes, no, no, but the last part will be a bit more. Um, what was in the cupboard? Well, what was in the cupboard was, as I told you already, a set of vessels, recipients, used for liquid offerings, for libations. And the prototype was the Egyptian citula. Um, my colleague and good friend, uh, the Syrian archaeologist uh, Michel Magdesi, just found a series of uh, these uh, citulae during his excavations at Amrit, and I, uh, I was asked to prepare a publication. They were found together with small amulets, bronze amulets, showing a priest in the middle of a libation. Uh, it always goes together in uh, the 7th, 6th century BC, citulae and these um, <coughs> Egyptian amuletic bronzes. Uh, this, the same set was found in Ashkelon, which is normal because uh, uh, our friend Patrick McGovern uh, showed us the Tanit and Elisa shipwrecks. These contained sausage jars from Tyre, which were on, their, uh, on the road for Ashkelon and not the other way around. The biggest uh, such cluster of citulae was, uh, was found at Memphis, Egypt. More precisely, in the necropolis of the sacred animals. And this necropolis was situated in the shadow of the Temple of Ptah. And this brings us to Herodotus, who described at this very spot, near the temple of Hephaestus, Ptah, the camp of the Tyrians. This, for the first time, we have proof of the presence of these Phoenician artists in Memphis. For if uh, we take a closer look at some of these citulae, certain details are completely un-Egyptian, such as a scarab with two pairs pairs of wings. If you know the Phoenicians, you have to look for them, but if you look for them, you find them. 
we know already of three citoli with uh, Phoenician inscriptions from the 7th, 6th century uh, BC. Uh, the one in the Louvre, alas, undeciphered um, as yet. And this brings us to another, uh, another uh, of the Celtic furnishings of the temple, the Sea of Bronzes. Scholars nowadays agree upon the fact that the, uh, the Sea of Bronzes is actually a reference to the wheeled uh, carts of the late Bronze Age. Most of them produced in Cyprus, but other ones in the Southern Levant. And here I'm showing you an example, just to uh, <clears throat> make a point. In uh, Phoenician midst, and I'm showing you this, the, the seal of uh, late 9th century seal of Shema. Here we have a cult statue, and if you look closely, you see that the god is standing with his feet on a wheeled cart. And this brings us to um, a kind of baldakin, could we speak of a tabernacle, driven around during ceremonies in um, Sidon on local coinage of the Roman uh, period. And you see that on top of the Balkan you have uh, these, these four palm branches. If you go to the Shia cemetery in, 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 in Tyre, for example, uh, during the Edel uh, Fitter, people also place these four palm branches on the graves of their uh, deceased. And actually, such wheeled cult stands have been excavated at Nimrud and other places in the Near East. A couple of uh, months ago, almost a year ago, uh, terracotta model shrines were found in uh, Keyafa in Israel and were uh, immediately uh, described as the prototypes of the Temple of Jerusalem for, as you see, the little model uh, reproduced uh, or enlarged to the right, shows for the first time a very important element of the Temple of Jerusalem, upon which I am going to end this presentation, namely the curtain, the temple's veil, a kind of a barrier uh, which, which, which was hiding the most sacred place, the innermost Holy of Holies in the temple. Um, I still have 10 minutes, perfect. Uh, oh, we have five minutes, okay. I have to uh, rush a bit. Uh, what you see here is, um, well, the curtain, you don't see it because it's wrapped around the rail on which it was hung, okay? Wrapped around, it is a very, very, very simple way of uh, getting rid of your curtain over days and then you just let it down and Maha, of course, recognizes one of the shops in the Souk of Tyre, more precisely in the uh, Sidonian uh, Harbor. Okay, this is the ID, the curtain. Please, please, please follow me. On a tablet, a cuneiform tablet from Ugari, 13th century BC, there is question about uh, the violation of something and about people getting the asylum right because they touched the veil of the temple of Sidon. This is the very first time that we hear uh, about the asylum right and a veil in the temple, a prefiguration of the veil in the temple of Jerusalem. And once again, we're in Phoenicia, in what was to become the Tyro Sidonian kingdom. Now, I cannot show you a photograph at the end of this uh, expose of the Temple of Jerusalem. In that case, I would have been a national geographic billionaire. But I can show you a document, a contemporary document, contemporary with the temple, which is as good as a best photo we will ever get, a Phoenician bow. And a Phoenician bow, which represents by four times not a zoo with exotic animals, but the structure of the innermost of the Jerusalem temple with its veil as described, and now I'm going back uh, to, my, uh, to my text, um, 2 Chronicles 3. What we are looking at are, uh, is a veil embroidered with the figures of falcon-headed wind, wind sphinxes, the cherubim of 2 Chronicles 3, fixed by means of 
what you see here on the drawing, fixed by means of a trellis fringe with tassels in the form of pomegranates. Pomegranates also adorned the, the, the robes of the priests officiating in the Jerusalem temple. And once again, this is preceded by, um, by, by, by the outfit of priests in Ugarit, where even the mold for, for uh, the gold pomegranates has been found in the course of the um, um, in the course of the excavations. Um, and uh, in 2 Chronicles 14, it is said, he, Solomon, uh, made interwoven chains and put them on top of the pillars. So forget all about these, these representations of Jachin and Boaz in, 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 in the Temple of Solomon. The, 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 there is no the question of capitals in the form of the pomegranates. Here, the pomegranates are here atop of the curtain which represents these cherubim as I showed you, as I pointed out uh, on uh, this slide. Now, finally, as a special present for Maha, Three more minutes, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, as a final present, a couple of years ago, the, the Spanish excavation brought to light this model of a shrine, and everyone thought, but what could this possibly be? Well, now that I told you about the temple, about the importance of the temple, the temple's veil, and about the tradition, the Phoenician tradition of veils, embroidered veils in the temple, what if I sold you this model as a model of a temple with a temple veil blowing out of the inner space. And if you don't believe me, I have you. By ending on a citation, quoting, and this is, uh, has everything to do with the last temple, the third temple, uh, the letter of Aristeos, where it is said, and I cannot translate this into English because the French is so beautiful, so you will ask, uh, for some of your colleagues afterwards, la façon, the way, la façon dont le voile était installé, the veil of the Temple of Jerusalem, rappelait tout à fait une portière, euh, en particulier l'étoffe était animée d'un mouvement continuel par l'air qui passait en bas, car l'ondulation partant du sol se propagait à partir de la partie souple de l'étoffe Jusque à la partie tendue en haut. La chose était assez jolie et l'on avait de la peine à en détacher les yeux. So much for the temple, so much for the son of the widow, Ahiram, for the first time now illustrated with archaeological documents from the homeland. And this is something we should have been done a generation or two generations ago because we were given a pair of ears, we were given a pair of eyes, and in the best of cases, also what my compatriot, Hercule Poirot, called the gray little cells. Let's use them. Thank you. I have to uh, say a personal note about how all of these speeches are taking me back to graduate school days and people like Javier Texador and Morton Smith talking about these same sites. Uh, thank you for opening, reopening my eyes on this. We are coming to the end of this marvelous symposium with a very intriguing speech, if, uh, if I may say so, a topic that um, is only coming into the fore the last decade or two. And that will be by Mrs. Rodi Kratza, who was born and brought up on the island of Zakynthos, Greece. She studied sociology at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Her postgraduate studies followed at the Institute of European Studies of that same university. She has rich experience in long tenure in European politics, having acquired important high-level positions as a member of the European Parliament and Vice President. She handled a significant portfolio, such as the conciliation procedure with other institutions, the EP communication and information policy, and the Euro-Mediterranean relations. She represented the European Parliament in high-level summits and ministerial conferences worldwide. She was member of the EP, uh, European Parliament, obviously, Committees on Economic and Monetary Affairs, Employment and Social Affairs, Transport, Budgetary Control, and Women's Rights and Gender Equality, with important initiatives and rich parliamentary work. In parallel, Mrs. Kratza has always been very active at international level. 
She has worked systematically for the deepening of uh, European Union relations with significant areas of the world, especially the Caucasus region, uh, the south shore of the Mediterranean, the Gulf Arab countries, and Latin America. She participates in major initiatives for peace in the Middle East and has taken an active role in protecting the rights of Christians and religious minorities where there is discrimination and violence, as well as the protection of the Jordan River. She is an ardent advocate of the civil society and actively participates in various organizations within Greece and beyond. Elected Municipal Council of Athens, 1998, as, as uh, she is president of the International Association for the Promotion of Women of Europe, Women of Europe Award, AIPFE, board member at the European Center of Culture, Geneva, member of the Honorary Committee of the Tyre Foundation, a board member of the Euro-Mediterranean University of Fes, Morocco. Mrs. Karatza has been honored by heads of state, religious leaders, and international bodies. She is an honorary doctor of two foreign university. She is also one of the four laureates of the Elissa Didon, Dido Award uh, for 2014. And this afternoon, she finishes the conference by addressing Elisa Didon, Dido, Mediterranean women. Mrs. Kratza. Thank you very much for so kind and generous words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me at first to thank you once again for your continuous presence and attention. Uh, perhaps some people will wonder why is this cultural and historical symbolism ending on, a, on an issue regarding women in the Mediterranean? I believe that the organizers and the designers of the program had the correct thought and choice with this issue, which has value both uh, historical and contemporary. It would be an efficient presentation of the Tyre as a center for culture for the Phoenicians and of the Mediterranean, and if we do not mention the women figures which played a vital role. Homer mentions that women of the Phoenicians were fantastic weavers and supplies the merchants throughout the Mediterranean with their fabric, which were a symbol of the culture of the Phoenicians, particularly in purple color. The Tyre also gave to the world figures of women which played a role in the genealogies and the alliances which determinate the ancient world and which continue until today. I mentioned at first Europe, a mythological but fatal figure, as mentioned by the professor Fanfar. As he said, uh, God Zeus took Europe to a ridge in Crete, where they had children, like King Minoa, founder of the Minoan civilization. And as he also said, the myth continues. Cadmus, Europe's brother, came to Greece, searching her, and just, I would like to add, uh, that during his stay, stay, he built a city, Thebes, which exists till today, which is about an hour from Athens. Ladies and gentlemen, the Phoenician princess Europe came from the Orient gave her name, of course, to the continent, which welcomed her. And I would like to say that the myth of adaption of Europe symbolizes the globalized world of that period. And throughout time, the close relations of the European countries with the, the, the and the European Union today with the countries from the south and the east of the Mediterranean. The institutional framework of these relations is called today Euro-Mediterranean Partnership and constitutes the Union for the Mediterranean. I come now to the main subject. Princess Elisa of Phoenicia is associated with the myth of the creation of the Carthage, uh, of to Carthage in today's Tunisia. The myth is a mix of historical evidence for the environment of the Phoenicia 
and with literary evidence from the Hellenic and Roman world. In the epic work of Virgil, Elisa is mentioned as uh, by the name Dido. The central person, Elisa, Dido for the Roman people, and uh, Didon, uh, coming for the Berber tradition eh, for the Tunisians, uh, incarnates the courage, the initiative, the determination, the creativity, and the fidelity. Displaced from Phoenicia due, due to domestic disputes, which deprives the life of her enamored, he managed to take those faithful with her, as well as young women for Cyprus, towards Tunisia. She builds Carthage in contradiction with the domestic powers, and she sacrificed herself to be loyal to her lost love. Building on the symbolic reference of this, a legendary heroine, Tile Foundation launched in cooperation with MED21, uh, the program of the Institute for Prize related to Mediterranean legacy, and Didon Gold Award of Carthage, who crowns Tunisian women actions, an award with the name Elisa Didon for the promotion of women condition in the Mediterranean. It will be awarded every year to two distinguished ladies, one for the North Shore and one for the South Shore. Winners are selected based on a significant contribution they made to promote principles and values and concrete achievements in all sectors area, sector areas culture, economics, education, politics, on the promotion of the status of women and equality. An important criterion of the award is the promotion of cooperation between the north and the south of the Mediterranean, linking people and actions. The award will be attributed every year during the, league, the, the, the festivities of the League of Canaanite, Phoenician, and Punic cities, from uh, uh, during the form closing uh, in general uh, with the atmosphere of uh, a gala dinner. There has already been the first award ceremony in Athens the previous October at the Acropolis Museum. I had the honor to be one of the laureates for this first edition due to the long-term avocation of the promotion of the Euro-Mediterranean relations and the role of women. The other laureates, which were four in total, only for the case of the first edition, are Lady Cochrane Yvonne Sursok from Lebanon, awarded in recognition for her, of her commitment to the protection of the legacy of the Lebanese cultural heritage across different sectors, architecture, arts, environment, the second one is Sherifa Keda from Algeria in recognition of her commitment to promote human rights, in particular the rights of uh, the victims of violence. And Suhayar Behassin from Tunisia in recognition of her fight for the rights of men and women in, in an international level. The importance of this award is great because it serves many goals. It reminds us of the role of women in history, something that historians often forget. It gives visibility and legacy to the work of women in the modern society, something which the mass media, the political parties, and the academic community also forgets. It brings to the surface women as role models and as examples to follow towards the encouragement for action and participation, not only for other women, but for the society. The Elisa Didon Prize with a direct or indirect method emphasizes that the human diversity, the equal rights and opportunities between men and women are occurring everywhere and especially around the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean 
with its countries and its people is not a uniform zone. At some places, women suffer from employment and the degradation of their standard of living, such as is the North Shore, as a result of the economic crisis. Elsewhere, along the South Shore, besides the economic problems, women are continuing to suffer violence and oppression for fundamentalists. It is important that we promote in international level these problems and issues, but also that we honor the exceptional women, giving a voice and support to the vulnerable women and who succeed in spite of the difficulties and make important work advancing the society and the encouragement of peace, cooperation, and justice. The Tire Foundation also has a goal to give the opportunity to the laureates of the prize to meet each other and to create networks of cooperation and solidarity. For the success of this goal, your support is valuable. Initially, your participation in the giving of the award Elisa Didon and other activities it, uh, <clears throat> it so that you can honor and meet these women and know their work. You can also support the effort of the Thai Foundation in this field through donations, through the programs of research centers, foundations, and international organizations. The Congress, which is hosting us today, as well as the American Civil Society, supports with passion and generosity the respect of human uh, rights and especially women's rights. We have uh, ascertained these past few years how important education, justice, equal opportunities, and the adv advancement of women are in all countries, everywhere, even those uh, that are far, so that we can have peace and prosperity globally and in our societies, in each society. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you and uh, express my belief that OE will have many opportunities for collaboration uh, supporting the entire foundation issues and uh, goals for the promotion of women. Thank you very much. I want to um, thank each one of the panelists uh, for a fitting conclusion to this wonderful conference. Thank you for your patience and your participation. Uh, there will be tours, I understand, after this. And uh, at the moment, I would like to finish by inviting the chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division, an energetic co-sponsor of this conference, Dr. Mary Jane D. Thank you. So, I just want to thank you all for being here. It's so exciting to see you, to, to have this, uh, this special program. Um, I hope that we will continue working on uh, ancient cities that have shared with us uh, the, and are the basis of our civilization as we know it today. Um, I, it's just uh, a word of thanks. Thanks to the participants. You have all been absolutely fabulous. Thank you for Maha for having made this event possible. Thank you for your team. Thank you for everyone who has come here from Tunisia, from France, from Belgium, from Spain, from Lebanon, and from around the world to be part of this very special event today. So thank you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.